Africa TV, Freak Up Studio, live. 2023, GSL Season 3. It's been dark way too long in this place. That bright smile long gone been What replaced. is up, everybody? Welcome to the round of eight here in the GSL Code S. It's going to be potentially a lot of TVZs here tonight. Yeah, it's fun. I yeah. feel like we're going to get a really deep dive into the TVZ matchup today to kick off the round of eight. And, you know, with a new patch or a new map pool, that's about the best you could ask for is a day where you're really going to be showcasing one matchup. And we have the potential today to have nothing but TVZ. And we could. We could also get a TVT and a ZVZ in there. We'll see. Uh, as you were saying, the matchup has changed a lot. The Cyclones changed a lot. Mm -hmm. We're still learning. Um, what this unit can do and how much of it uh, and whatever it's doing, it can pull off. It does function more um, like a unit that's mixed into the rest of the Terran army, uh, whereas before it was kind of like, I think we referred to it as like a Swiss army knife unit. Yeah. A kind of fix all for defending your base on, on two bases, occasionally used in some of these more technical pushes um, in TVT uh, and other matchups at time. But um, yeah, I mean, we got some great Terran, some great Zergs. We're gonna get to do a real deep dive into the matchup and uh, I could not be more excited. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun, especially having Cure and Gumiho both playing today who have kind of different styles of TVZ. Gumiho, just going back years and years, has kind of been known as the mech god. It's, yeah. He's been able to make it work even in metas where mech really did not feel like it was viable. Gumiho just always had aces up his sleeve. And I just can't wait to see how he decides to use the Cyclone tonight because now in the round of eight, really the cool builds are going to come out. You want to fire everything you got to try and make it to the finals. But before we get there, of course, GSL, we're doing a lot of crowdfunding nowadays. It's kind of the way that StarCraft 2 and really eSports as a whole, RTS eSports especially, is trending as we lost published support. But I mean, the support from the community has been absolutely monumental. Already nearly $32,000. And this goes to directly fund the prize pool, support the players, support the Korean StarCraft 2 scene. So from the bottom of our heart, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, we already surpassed our goal, so that'll roll over into the next season of GSL. But um, yeah, all that money goes to the prize pool minus the cut Patreon takes. Um, so guys, uh, we appreciate the support. We love you. We're like just about halfway through the tournament. We already hit the goal, which is incredible. And we are looking forward to um, I don't know, wrapping this one up and getting another GSL started up here uh, down the road. But this tournament's been a weird one, man. Maru eliminated very uh, at the very first elimination point of this tournament. So it's kind of a toss up as far as who's going to take it. Mara, of course, being the most consistent GSL player of all time, always the safest bet as far as who's going to take it. So uh, now it's really up for grabs in season three. And if you guys want to come down to the studio and catch this live, you got the information on your screen. We are the Eureka TV Free Cup studio. That's also where the finals is going to be held next week. So make sure you're aware of that. And you can buy those tickets online at the link listed below and make sure you get those early because you know round of eight and then finally once we go to the finals day next week we have the round of four and the finals on the same day yeah. so a very high chance that one gets sold out make sure you get those as soon as you can of course if you have difficulty buying them online and we don't have a sold out crowd it's possible that you can buy the tickets at the door when you come to the studio but i i do recommend that you try to yeah. get them online just to be safe get them online buy it early um, whether you're staying here in Korea or you're flying in uh, to visit, make sure you get that as quick as possible because uh, once it's sold out, we just can't let you know additional people into the building. We're across the street from the fire department. We will get in trouble <laughs> if we go over the capacity. <laughs> yeah, we literally so we, are. <laughs> we got to be careful. Um, you can see the entire makeup of the round of eight over here. Uh, I'm especially excited about group B actually with our two Protosses, Dark and Bunny. Uh, I think Dark probably the favorite to move out of that, but I would say so. We hope to get at least one Protoss advancing here to the round of four. Always nice to get that golden ratio. Yeah, there's a good chance. I think Creator and Classic are actually playing a PvP to kick off that series, if I'm not mistaken, which means one of them is going to be at least one match away from qualifying for the semifinals here as we look at the playoff bracket, of course. Round of eight, same as the round of 16. It's the same classic four-player GSL group format, but then we go into the single elimination section of the tournament next week on Thursday. Should be a lot of fun. And really, this is a fantastic top eight field to have. And, you know, in, one, in some way, it's kind of sad not to have Maru in the picture because he is the GOAT of Korean StarCraft 2. But in another way, it really shakes things up. You know, Cure 
every GSL this year, Maru has been his kryptonite. He's been the one to stop him. He just got picked up by Team Liquid, guys. If you missed the news, Kira, the most recent member to join that team, now representing Team Liquid, is he going to get a GSL title this year? Maru is out of the picture and Cure looks stronger than ever. Yeah, I agree. I think he could totally take it. If there was ever a season, this would be the one. Uh, honestly, he's playing better than ever. Um, and so I I'm really looking forward to, to seeing how he's going to play here. Um, or, you know, if he can actually just crush through and, and, and take the, the thing entirely. Cure has always looked good, but um, he just seems to be almost unworldly good as yeah. of now. I mean, historically, Cure's been kind of a TVP icon in Korea. No one really has been able to hold a candle to his TVP as a matchup. And I, I don't want to say he's a one-trick pony because he's always been one of the best players. But until recently, it feels like his TVP overshadowed his TVT and his TVZ. But now coming in to 2023, he feels so much more well-rounded. You can tell the hard work is paying off. and so. DRG is not going up against just one of the best players in the world. He's going up against arguably one of the best TVZ players in the world. I watched Cure play a best of five against Cyril just a number of weeks ago. And yes, that was an online cup, but it went all the way into the final map in a best of five scenario against arguably the, the best ZVT player of you know this generation yeah. of StarCraft II as Cure is just really fleshing himself out. I think Cure probably the favorite to advance from this group, but then again, it is a new patch. It's a new map pool, and DRG is also historically one of the best Zergs in Korea. I feel like we're kind of shining a big spotlight right now on Cure, but really this is going to be kind of an upheaval in terms of a group. Really anyone can advance from this one, so I'm very excited to get started. Cure versus DRG coming up. All right, guys, we're ready to get into this match. Cure versus DRG, best of three starts now. Club NV, DRG. Okay, immediately we've got two SCVs moving out on the map. Yeah, we're starting this yeah. one on Alcyone, and Kira actually mined out the tiny little mineral patch that walls off this bottom section of the map, yeah. and he's sending two SCVs three. through it. Three, I believe. Oh, three, in yeah. fact. And so, I mean, this is pretty crazy. This is going to be very, very nearby. There's actually an Overlord here, but I don't know that the trajectory is going to cover this. Hey, we appreciate you. Welcome <laughs> down to the studio. So good to have an audience back here. Yeah, I, I don't so, think the Overlord is going to spot this. I think it's going to be just out of vision range, but if it is going to get it, it would be just over the, the very edge of the barracks. Hold on. I think, hold I, on. I, I think it's just out of view, Tasteless. Oh, come on. Why let, are let's we going see. over that Overlord? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. literally the place. It doesn't matter. Okay, so. This is wild. This is um, going to blindside DRG. Now it's two racks over three. The third racks, I, I think this is such a cool part of this build. Mm -hmm. It's always made a little bit further away so that if you do scout it, you, you don't quite get the entire picture. Yeah, if it is two racks, it's a lot easier for Terran to transition out of it. Of course, it's still right. effectively, it is very much an all-in strategy that you're going for. It's high pressure, but hiding that third racks means that should that Overlord have scouted it, would not have been able to get the full picture and now Cure with the extra SCVs that he has pulled to build those barracks, mining out the second mineral patch and the bunker rush, it's already begun. So DRG, now that the hatchery is finished and he has vision, knows exactly what is coming up. And we'll see what his response is immediately. A roach warrant and his second gas guys are getting thrown down. I think this is telegraphing that DRG is gonna try and give up this hatchery and try to bust down with Ravagers, but we'll see yeah. exactly there, how he decides to hold. There is a, a Ravager bust that you can set up where you can try to swing it back across the map. Um, and this is, like you were saying earlier, State, this is a, a builder that doesn't allow you to recover as easily post-rush. Uh, he's kept a decent amount of the Lings alive over here. Uh, he's going to try to target that Queen down as best he can, send some of the Marines back into the bunker. Um, and we're at about half HP here. The Creep Tumors are going to try to be connected and bridge uh, what will soon be a dead second base along with this uh, this first base with the roaches coming up here as well. But 
I mean, this is a tough one here for DRT, and DRT does not have a lot of time inside of this game to um, adjust. And we see a tech lap, by the way, being Ooh. made on the third barracks. Yeah, I I'm guessing Kira's going to start mixing in some Marauders with this, so he is... He yeah, has I no plans to really start transitioning. I think he's anticipating this Roach reaction from DRG because DRG never really put up a fight oh. to hold the natural, and the Ravager's even morphing in here on the low ground, so DRG is going to have a very good engagement. Well, this is pretty smart. He's not going to expand right away. What he wants to do is actually uh, plow down the push out as DRG tries to escape the base, right? To actually take advantage of the bunker, to get Marauders out here, to use concussive shells so the retreating Ravagers and Roaches can't get away. Yeah, but... I, I, I would have thought we would have had a second bunker if he was going to go this route. I'm a little concerned for DRG making this play, though, on the low ground because that's a lot of more barracks units getting rallied out. There isn't a transition coming in from Cure. So DRG might be caught a little bit off guard of Marauders with concussive shell joining the mix because if Cure can somehow amass enough bio there on the low ground and keep that bunker alive. If he's able to section off these Ravagers, they have nowhere to go outside of that expansion. If he gets the kill on them, that's basically a game-ending move, and you can see him starting to test the waters a little bit. He has to be very careful because there is going to be no healing coming in for this bio. There is Stim starting. Yeah, the Ravagers that you see on the low ground, they really can't actually get up into the high ground without being shot at by the bunker. So we need to see, is there a moment that Kier can identify um, where he, uh, hold on, sorry, DRG can identify where he's gonna try to bust this open. We see Ling speed's done, so that may prompt him to try to come in here and attack. <gasps> oh, oh, yeah, it's dangerous. Ling speed is done. I think if, if DRG, if he was able to keep that Ravager alive and just continuing files here on this. Oh man, he's rallying this one too. Oh, this is a mistake. Yeah, Ravager's already getting picked off. Now the Ling's are gonna come out, but that is so much bio on the low ground right now. Kira back at home, he's not transitioning. There is no factory, no starport, no command center. It is just what you see on screen. And I think DRG is not prepared for this follow-up. Oh, Stim, it's about halfway done. And you got to think that once it completes, okay, that Bile does connect with the Marauders and a couple of Marines. But once Stim is done, I don't think Kira's really going to be contested here. Yeah, well, I mean, the longer this game goes on, the harder it is for Zerg to get out. I mean, you just, you, you know, the number of hatcheries alone is a problem. And uh, you can kind of drag this game out as a Terran and then eventually quietly take that uh, second command center. Because Zerg, if they don't break this, they're never going to get out on the map. Yeah, and DRG, the fact that he bled off you know, some Ravagers means that he doesn't have enough files to really outpace the heal here. So he's going to take even more damage, oh pushing gosh. forward. Another Ravager almost getting sniped down. Two gonna, of them, in fact. It's going to get repaired. That actually might be it. I think Stimpak is done even. Yeah. Oh, and what a build by Cure. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of crazy to see a build like this. Wow. Um, just come out this late, you know, in the game. But I, I like the idea. That you is know, a, a cool play. A lot of Terrans would have made a command center earlier, and then it would have been the Zerg breaking out and the Terran holding back at home. But here, you don't even expand. A one-base Terran technically is better than a one-base Zerg. I mean, this is why we always see Zerks having to expand faster than uh, Terrans, faster than Protosses. Occasionally, they'll go even on bases, but one base is really kind of impossible. You just need enough hatcheries, uh, you know, with enough queens and everything out to where you can get that engine really going. So, Cure just holds the low ground. Concussive shells punish the few stray Ravagers that come out. And then Stim. I mean, it looks like we probably almost didn't even need it to close that game out, but I think the stem really is the ace up the sleeve there. Is if Zerg commits, now it's not worth it at all. And so a very short game here for game one. Yeah, Kier coming through with some really solid build preparation. I love that opening there on Alcyone, especially considering you don't have many builds, many proxies so far in the GSL that we've seen on that side of the map. And we'll see if Cure has something special cooked up for Site Delta as we're getting ready to go up into game number two. Cure leading this series with DRG 1-0. Club NV, DRG.
Going back to that game one build, I mean, how often have we seen three barracks proxied with no gas on the other side of the map, but the Terran tries to bank a couple of Marines and then go for something like an SCV pull? Right. To end the game straight away. And this is just a different flavor of this three barracks opening that we saw from Cure there in game number one, where instead of that, he doesn't he doesn't pull SCVs. It was just the two or three SCVs that were there the entire time repairing the bunker. It's brilliant, too, because the third uh, barracks is far away enough, right? Uh-huh. Ah, from, from China. Welcome, guys. Much love. Good to see people from all over down here. I see that um, sign in the back, too, from San Jose, California. Let's go. <laughs> That's my hometown, man. Yeah, it's Bay um, Area. Oh, there he is. Just went from. Okay, we're doing that sign justice now. <laughs> Best flavor. I wish. I, so I could. I wish I can't. I wish I could see which flavor of Hot Six that actually was. But with the dim lighting that we have this here, we're doing the audience. show on hard mode, man. Trying to guess the colors of the cans in the dark. <laughs> um, but that third barracks, putting the tech lab on it. It's even so if, smart. Even if you see the first two barracks, you might think, okay, well he's going to expand. I only see two. Mm -hmm. uh, and then having the Marauders slow drip come out from there. And stim, the ace in the, up the sleeve, yeah. as you said. It's we're, just we're, so smart. When it seems like we built up to the climax where Zerg probably has enough Zerg Zerglings and probably has enough Roaches and Ravagers, then you can overpower them with the stim. And stim is great if it all comes down to one fight. Stim mm -hmm. almost always wins if it's pretty even. The thing is, is like if he had to stim over time, he would have depleted all the hit points. But, I mean, a really cool strategy coming out here from Cure. One I don't think we're going to see again today. Uh but definitely one that was you know, pretty difficult for DRG to deal with. By the way, in an era where we don't see that uh, opener as much anymore. Yeah, the, especially now with the Tech Lab and Marauders. Yeah, proxy two racks, po proxy three racks was, um, I feel like Maru probably still did it the most. Yeah, I think you're Although almost definitely. I think we had a, definitely. Couple, a couple games where Bunny would bring it out here or there, but that's a very different version. A lot of the stuff that Cure does now just looks very different. It seems like he's really labbed out a lot of things i think the new patch has been really good for him um and he seems to just be more uh on top of the new ideas that can be used in this version of the game one of the things that made him so scary in tvp for a long time was just the range he was able to bring to the table and i feel like over the past couple of months he's evolved his tbt and his tbz to kind of get to the same level and even now he cancels one of the Reapers that he was producing out of this because he, he knew that he had just enough damage to get the hatchery down. And oh, oh and look at this sick micro on the high What is ground. going on? Okay, DRG is going for a Ling Flood. 20 Lings in production. I don't know if this is going to be a winning play. Behind this, Kira is going for his third command center. So the fact that we don't have gas trickling in for DRG right now, I'm not sure how much he's actually going to be able to get done with this. None of those Reapers got taken out. Kira is very smartly moving back to his side of the map. And if these Lings can't find too much damage... Well, you know, a lot of times when you're hurting the Zerg early on, you could almost predict that there's going to be some kind of dramatic counterplay. Yeah. Right? And so sometimes you kill off a couple drones, or in this case, you kill the drone that was going to be the hatchery and delay the third hatchery. Um, if you just play slightly more conservatively, you'll probably stop what they're going to do and, and be in good shape. But these Lings were not committed to going all the way across the map. They're just out on the map in high enough number where I think they can surround and kill um, Reapers if the Reapers stay too active on the map. But uh, DRG, I mean, already having just a very tough time navigating the first couple of minutes of a, a ZVT here versus Cure. Yeah, and I wonder if this is the kind of push that DRG was hoping to catch a little bit earlier. Should Cure have been able to move across the map, you know, a, a minute sooner than those links would have had a tremendous value intercepting a push like this one, but Instead, it's a bit delayed. There are seven Marines or so coming out with this push, and more Lings now coming through in production for DRG. He does have two queued up, but is almost supply blocked. So has to produce three Overlords at a time. Kind of an unfortunate time to get supply blocked in this matchup as the Lings going to come in here on the flank. We'll see the surround they get. And actually, with the Queens, you can see them immediately paying dividends. All right, I was skeptical yeah, that was, of that, that Ling, sick. but... Man, those 24 Lings got so much work done. And talk about an anti-timing there from the Terran. That attack ended the same time Stim finished. So DRG has really taken control now of this, uh, you know, we're kind of entering into mid game here. He He's really in a position where this is playable now. Um, I think Cure's proven that he's got a lot of good ideas early on. It makes, you know, most of the rest of the game very inconvenient for what DRG has probably practiced, but that little tactical setup was really good. And now I think DRG is in pretty good shape. 
Yeah, he just makes another round of Lings, reinforces a little bit. 1-1 one, one already starting here for a DRG. The first engineering phase only just now going down for Cure, so... Also going to be one of those rare moments where the Zerg is going to have an upgrade advantage over the Terran in this matchup. Oftentimes, it's, it's the other way around, as these drones, I guess, wanted to join the Lings on attacking those rocks, but... I'm liking the setup right now for DRG. I mean, those... Being able to take down those rocks, this map is kind of choky, right? So, mm -hmm. opening up a couple different avenues of attack and having some more room to play with to try and get surrounds with these links is going to go a long way towards helping DRG hold off the Hellbat push that is slowly working its way across the map. By the way, um, this could be a real problem. The drone's going to get denied over here at the fourth base. Terran's taking a third before Zerg has the fourth, which is generally not a good sign. The Hellbats are actually kind of nicely positioned in between the Marines, which makes it really hard to actually engage them at all with the Lings. Even the few Lings that come up to the top left don't fare too well. And I think this might just barely be enough to snowball the fight. Yeah, all the Queens go down. It was some nice control there by DRG for the moment, oh. but he didn't have enough reinforcing oh. units. And he walks right into the, uh, the tech here, seeing the Banelings Nest is going to give you a very good idea of where exactly you are. Uh, in a game like this, and I don't even know if there's enough links to, to be, make Banes in a way that can be meaningful. The medevac is out of energy, so it is possible this gets overwhelmed, but wedged between the uh, Vespian Gas Geyser and the Minerals makes it a kind of inconvenient position to try to dive into. Zerg survives, but I would imagine the second uh, incoming attack could be a fatal one here. Yeah, it's going to be very hard for DRG. Losing those Queens is... Really a bummer in terms of macro and also in defense back at home as he, I think, got reset all the way down to just three queens, so barely enough to manage injects on these three hatcheries, which is so crucial for playing this heavy ling style because you do need a lot of larva. You need to be on top of your injects if you want to macro effectively with this one. But he does have 1-1 one, one completed already. Unfortunately for him, Cure doesn't really have any weaknesses in his play right now, so DRG can't really leverage this upgrade timing window to find any damage. and. Once Kieran pushes across the map with six more Hellbats and a handful more Marines and a lot more Medivacs, he's going to have a 1-1 finish as well. So the upgrades, they will equalize. I can see DRG on the minimap. He's looking to try and get some kind of counter damage done on Kieran's third base, but the wall's already set up. The rally point is also in a really good position to deal with this. Now there's not very much at home to actually defend. Yeah, and there might be enough sustain over here from the Terran. Oh, actually, maybe not. It looks like that was a really good Banelink connect. And so uh, that position is denied. The counterattack from the Zerg is also denied. We got to go back to the main theme that's been happening the last few minutes, which is that Zerg doesn't have a fourth base up and running. And the threat of the Terran remains. Uh, a lot of this just comes down to control who can have a better engage, who can um, eke out a little bit more damage. Catching these queens off the creep is huge. This is one of the punishing things about StarCraft where you tell, tell a group of units to move somewhere, mm -hmm. half go the right way, the way that you envisioned it. The other half will curve around the outer uh, area. And that's going to be another um, little bit of a weakness here for uh, DRG. In fact, again, he's barely holding on in each of these attacks. But the threat is real. The fourth base, by the way, does finish for him as well. If he can hold this attack and drone up at his fourth, he does have a shot. The question is, does he hold? Yeah, these trades have been so cost efficient for Cure. I mean, the splits are just incredible, and there's no creep really to speak of. All the Banelings and Lings get cleaned up. Cure is stemming forward on top of the Queens. Damn. DRG taps out. Dude, Cure just has a handle on this matchup like nothing I have seen in a long time. And let's not forget how that game started. DRG had yeah. a very smart play. He made 24 Lings at a time of the game, which was you know, kind of awkward, you know, it's not expected. And as a result of it, he was able to wipe the floor with Cure's opening push. And despite Cure not getting anything done with that initial attack, the follow-up was still strong enough to actually take down the Zerg. It killed so many Queens and reset DRG back to three base. And you can kind of see the expression on DRG's face. He knows that he's probably gonna have to play more ZBTs today if he wants to emerge <sighs> yeah. out of this group. Well, but no, no matter what, he has to figure that matchup out on some level. If yeah. not, if not with um, Cure, then at least with Gumiho. Guys, short break. Coming up next, Gumiho versus Solar. You don't want to miss it. We will be right back.
똑같은 하루에서 답답함을 빼면 더 청량해질 거야. 제로처럼. 우리 없어도 되는 건 빼고 살자. 칠성사이다 제로. 우주급 텐션 최고의 토킹 핫식스 토킹 하늘은 우리 향이 울려있어 그리고 내게 청량한 이 순간 실성사이다로부터 실성사이다 똑같은 하루에서 답답함을 빼면 더 청량해질 거야 제로처럼 우리 없어도 되는 건 빼고 살자 실성사이다 제로 청량한 이 순간 실성사이다로부터 실성사이다 우주급 텐션 최고의 토킹 핫식스 토킹 귀엽고 잘생겼어요 아이돌 상이라서 우와 행복이 느껴지고 단순한 머리는 약할 것 같다 또 부러지는 모습을 본 적이 없어가지고 요리도 엄청 잘하고 동생이니까 뭐 부려먹기도 쉽고 다 시키고 저는 편안하게 좀 하고 싶습니다 Today's matchup Cure DRG Gumio Silver Round of eight Group A Africa TV, Freak Up Studio, live, 2023, GSL Season 3. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. What a crazy short series and what I thought was going to be, I don't know, I thought it was going to be, you know, an hour plus TVZ. I think this one should be longer because Gumiho, although he can rush, he does like to mech and kind of slow play it. Um, Solar is very, very apt at the kind of long drawn out ZVTs. Like the rest of the Zergs, he'll occasionally pull the trigger and do something aggro, because I think you kind of have to do that if you're going to have, you know, some balance and keep the other guy guessing. The thing about Gumiho is he could just abandon mech entirely. Yeah, we've seen him mixing up both mech and bio play, and that can be hard for DRG. And I mean, let's let's not forget DRG also in this group might have to play Gumiho to advance from this one later, but also Solar to prepare for the fact yeah. that not only do you have to deal with Cure, who is just one of the best players in the world right now, he is really get, coming on to the next level, but Gumiho has such a unique style of Terran versus everything in terms of him mixing in mech, using the new Cyclones, switching into Bio. He has a tremendous range, but as you said, he is much more of a macro Terran player, so I would be surprised if this series was anywhere close to short as the first one, which I think wrapped up in like 15 minutes or something. It's something that was crazy really like quick. that. Yeah, it had to be less than 20. Um, well, you know, Solar, always a threat, always someone who could take down any player in the GSL and has taken down every player in the GSL. So 
you know, it really just depends on what kind of day it's going to be here for Solar. Now, Gumiho, honestly, when we had the patch notes come out, he was the first player I just started thinking about because I thought, well, his games are going right. to be different if there's a big focus on the Cyclone. Um, we'll see what he uh, what he decides to do with it. And, um, yeah, the winner goes up against Kira here in the winner's match. DRG awaits for the loser of this as well as we are rapidly moving through Group A. Uh, group, uh, yeah, it's A here in the round of eight, excuse me. Uh, looks like our countdown has started. Gumiho versus Solar. This set beginning here now. How exactly is Gumiho going to play this? He's got some of the biggest range of plays out there, whereas Solar just all around solid. Pause here. Uh oh, yeah, Gumiho coming through with the pause. Yep. Wonder what the issue is. So we'll let you guys know what the issue is exactly. Um, oh, it, it seems like it might be a sound issue. He's gesturing at his his headset. Oh, it's possible the earbud fell out. Yeah. So the way it works for those of the uh, you who don't know. There's one set of earbuds that has the actual game sounds on here. There's another headset that basically pumps in. I think it's called white noise. So, oh, oh, and in fact, okay, we just got notified by production. The white noise volume was too low, so he could hear things. Yeah. Wow. Gooby well, what an honorable gamer. What a legend. Yeah. I would be up there in the booth just like, no whisper in my like, ear, I'd tasteless. Like, oh, my God. The <laughs> universe me when, wants me to win this. <laughs> tell like, me when to build yes. the dark shrine. But, yeah, I, as you were saying, the way that it works is you have these earbuds that have the in-game sound. Yeah. Those go inside of your ears. And then the headsets that you see on screen, the really big, bulky ones, not only are they generally soundproofing, yeah. but they pump white noise so, through. It, it sounds like you're in an airplane. Yes. Because I remember when I played in Pro League, dealing with these it was such a weird experience it, i felt like it was drowning my thoughts how loud it was when, when we did tasis land party 2 and i played that match against scarlet that was my first time actually playing with the uh white noise like i had put uh -huh. the headsets on before <laughs> you know like the day before any of the events i've worked and been like oh so that's what it sounds like but uh it is a weird experience because yeah it feels like you're on an airplane it, it's very i don't know if disorienting is the word but it just, does feel disorienting though it just yeah. it's so Considering that these guys have played, solar. I forgot we didn't even complete the intros yet, but I mean, considering these players have competed for what, maybe like 10, 20, 30,000 hours in StarCraft 2 over a decade of their life, not even yeah. counting StarCraft 1, and you're doing that in the comfort of your own home or maybe a PC bong occasionally with just the, the sound and music getting pumped in, and then you go into a studio setting. If it's the first time ever and you're suddenly having that sound getting overshadowed by tremendously loud white noise yeah and, and lights and camera lenses moving around in your peripheral yeah yeah yeah, that too but really the white noise more than anything else always always bothered me so kumiho very respectable notifying immediately the admin staff that the white noise is too quiet i'll, I'll tell you a story like way back at starcraft one wcg days when we would go to the competition in the u.s there was a couple finals we got to, like I got to with some of the other players, and the PCs they had set up, they had a tablecloth, <laughs> like a, a, you know, a, on the table where the PCs set up, where if, you, if you've ever used a mouse, on a mouse pad with a tablecloth, you'd know that you can't. It starts just jostling around yeah, on top of that it, thing. It, it, it doesn't work well. No so grip, was, right? There's no grip, yeah. And so there was like always this big fight that would happen at the finals where we would have to have them remove the tablecloth and for whatever reason the rep would be like we can't we can't move the tablecloth <laughs> table and like some cloth. players would roll the tablecloth up and move it out <laughs> and it would just be that wooden ugly wooden board underneath it and then one case we got them to just take the thing off entirely but um yeah, land, th things are very different now where it's all about player comfort yeah lands can be pretty janky i know there are a lot of uh Tournaments as the Reaper comes in. We'll see if this one actually is able to get too much done. Generally speaking, in this day in Ancient Starcraft 2, this initial Reaper will kill, like, maybe a Ling and not too much more. But Gumiho is going for two racks on the low ground. There are two more Reapers getting pumped across the map. So this damage is starting to pile up. But 
finally, the queen able to parry this away as Gumiho's going to look for another angle. Perhaps just going to start damaging this third hatchery, but it is always funny if you go to a land that's not a completely professional setup or even not a permanent setup like we have at the GSL, yeah. where the boos are just always there and the players are always ready to go to the same scenario because you know, sometimes you go to other lands and the desk is either too small or the monitor has to be right in front of you and there's not enough space. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, the monitor is too close and there's not enough room on the desk. There's a lot of stuff that can go on there. By the way, uh, this hatchery is not going to finish. The queens are way too far away. The drone gets killed off. Now, it does seem like the Zerks, at least today, but we'll probably see more and more of this, just basically go for a swap. But Gumiho seems to already know that. Wait a minute. Oh. Is he not... He had to have seen that, right? Yeah, I thought he did. I don't know where he is sending those Reapers, actually. Why, why would he not just go start the same thing again on that hatchery? That's strange. Maybe, I, I think maybe it's because, he knows there's enough lings out, kind of yeah. like the last game, where... I, I think there's probably a little bit of a meta game because at this stage in the game, you know, speed is going to be done. And if you are overextending with these Reapers and someone like DRG pumps out 20 lings as before, but now he's coming back in. So maybe he had to go back and take care of some stuff in the, the macro cycle, like just right click him somewhere that's safe. Maybe, but at Gumiho's level, I, I wouldn't. No, I, I, I would think even I'm not it. sold on what I said there, but. Yeah, so um, you, maybe if Gumiho's in gold, yeah, yeah. Like, that will make sense. <laughs> but the idea, like, that, the idea that occasionally you would just try to figure out what's my priority, be like, okay, I need to move this over here. Uh, some some moments in a macro cycle could be harder I, than others. But yeah, I mean, he stayed back. He's going to have Marines with Stim. He could just kind of have this ground push that comes through where, um, you know, with Creep not fully connected to that third base, maybe he can have another attack in where he can overpower the Zerg. I, I think he was just doing the same thing that Kira did when Kira brought back his Reapers, where they're playing the metagame. I guess it seems that a lot of Zergs right now are trying to go for a, a brief flood of Lings, just one big round to try and swarm the Reapers, because actually having five or six Reapers, or in this case four with a push like this one, they don't pack a lot of a punch, but occasionally those grenades can do a great job of stunning the army, especially on a map like Alcyone. That watchtower, for instance, it's very choky getting around in this. Oh, this is one of the fake Overlord Pillars? I guess it is. Occasionally, these Overlord Pillars on the map, they don't actually shield you from yeah, yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a doodad on the map that doesn't give you any cover. Yeah, or maybe it was the watchtower that was giving vision. Actually, on some of these new maps, I'm not sure of all of these interactions that can take place. You well, know, that, that's why we see a lot of these micro errors happen in uh, a, a set of new maps as people haven't, you know, figured out everything yet. Yeah, actually on, um, I, I think the map is, oh, I can't, I, I think it's Hecate, the map that I'm recalling, but I, I watched Creator versus, I can't remember which is where it might've even been Solar from Group A, and Solar put his Overlord on a pillar that you can actually see. If you send an Adept onto the high ground in your base, you can kill that Overlord with the Stalker, and so, after that day of GSL, I messaged him on Discord. I'm like, hey, if this happens again, go kill that Overlord, bro. Yeah. And he's like, oh, nice. That's but, so funny. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that happens when you have new maps entering the pool is occasionally Overlords like that one will get caught out. Did you remember that GSL were parting? Realized you could actually cannon rush on the low ground of a ramp on one of the new GSMOs. They didn't have the the, the proper uh, unbuildable yeah, plates there. Yeah, that was there. against Solar, wasn't it? I, I, think, I think that was so, against yeah, Solar. We saw it. We're like, oh, we're actually not allowed to have maps like that anymore. But like, he just knew that they hadn't fixed it <laughs> what yet. What a scumbag! Yeah, and it's like, well, <laughs> he's like, this is technically sorry, not supposed to Solar, be allowed. I guess, you're, I guess you lose this one, but we'll we'll have this fixed next week. I, I love moments like that. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny too because it has to stand right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, you're playing the, 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 the maps that you're playing on. All right, so the Lings come in here. Grimio just going to lift everything back up. He is macroing back at home, taking a third command center, plus one, one. About done for him. Seems considerably faster than Solar. I actually thought that Solar was keeping pace with us, but I didn't realize that plus one melee attack is actually quite delayed. Yeah, he's not going to pack the same kind of punch as uh, he would if he had that, uh, had that been upgraded a little bit earlier, started a little bit earlier. Um, the roaming's pretty good here from Gumiho. It looks like he's going to push all the way up to uh, this area over here. He has enough medevacs that he can full-on pick up. Looks like the Lynx, he wants to come around here from the bottom, maybe try to force this around and get a stray wow. uh, Marine hit with the Baneling. Instead, the pickup happens. He's going to swing around here. Yeah, Baneling speed, even though it does research faster on the new patch, I mean, it's... Still quite a long ways away, so Gumiho is getting a tremendous amount of value here. Oh, focus firing, a bunch of oh. the Baneling's coming in. Only loses a couple of Marines and some Reapers there on the low ground. I, I don't think we saw a Baneling actually detonate and kill a Marine back there. No, and there were three or four, I think, at least, that got picked off. That, that was insane. 
And that was so cost efficient for Gumiho that I'm, I'm concerned now for Solar. Even though plus one Carapace is done, even though Baneling speed is completed, there are some Hellbats also entering the fray. If these next trades are also cost efficient for Gumiho, it might just be the snowball effect that we saw with Cure in the previous map against DRG. And Gumiho once again be lifting up into the main base. One of the features here on Alcyone is it's really hard to move from the triangle third into this corner of the main. Drop chip play is very effective as a result of that. So that's part of the reason why Solar is going into Hydralis to try and get it some control. Oh. I love the queen play right there, catching these medevacs, getting a lot of damage in. Now he can force the unload over here. There's a lot uh, out for Terran right now. I think he could actually do a pincer attack here. There's almost more Marines than Lings on the yeah. field right now. And anytime you have that kind of ratio, it's a very scary moment for the Zerg. Well, the Queens are tanking pretty nicely. A couple more transfuses go down. We even have some Reaper grenades still popping in this fight, which yeah, is just insane. It's wild. At nine minutes. And now the other attack's gonna come in here from the top. So he's eked out a lot of extra damage here with these Marines. But now oh. comes a second wave in here, and the Bailings are mostly hitting the spread out Marines on the bottom. The next wave is actually stuck behind the Hydras and the Queens. These Lings come in here for a flank. The control here from Gumio looking pretty good. But there's still so much here from the Zerg. At the end of the day, Solar does fight it all the way back. Yeah, that was a really tough engagement for Solar to take, but he handled it about as perfectly as you possibly could. I love the links coming in from that ramp at the top left, just getting the full surround. I mean, coming into that fight, the army supplies were relatively close. Gumiho, I think, might have even had an advantage for a brief moment there, but Solar just really navigating that so well. So now Gumiho going to try and fight back and get some tempo by clearing creep, but Solar instantly repopulating with new tumors. Hive tech is underway. We even have some Infestors coming out onto the field. And keep in mind, Infestors, although fungal range has been reduced in terms of its casting and the damage is not quite as substantial as it once was, as soon as Infestors pop, they now have 755 energy available for fungal growth. So. There is some potential that if Solar is able to connect with one or two fungals on a clump of medevacs, we'll have something akin to what we saw in Group A with Scarlet versus Maru, where the Hydras just can absolutely shred the bio in. Really a momentum-changing play. And that seems to be what Solar is gunning for. He's not going to be hedging his bets too much on the investors. In fact, only producing one. And we'll see what he's able to get done with this. Oh, what a beautiful fungal. The Banelings instantly connect. Nothing gets picked up. And Solar smashes that. And as we're ramping up to the uh, max out here of units, I got to wonder, is it going to be Solar's turn here to try to come out and attack? We've got a Lurker's Den on the way. Um, you know, the fourth base for Terran is up. It looks like SCVs are being transferred over there now. But overall, Solar in a really healthy spot. Um, we've got another push coming out from Gumiho. But it looks like there's enough here for Solar to try to fight that back. And I wouldn't be too shocked if we start to see Solar expand down uh, to the bottom right side of the map and pave that out with more creep. I love the way that Solar is playing this. He's doing so well. He's already getting his adrenal glands. He's matching the Terran upgrades now at 2-2. I'm sure 3-3 is on the way for the Zerg as well. And yes, in fact, it is. Lurgerden also in production. And hey, let's not forget that a, a few moments ago, Gumiho had basically more Marines than there were Lings on the map and he was attacking it from two different angles. And since then, Solar has just taken all of his engagement so well. This Infester has to be really respected here too, even though the range is a little bit shorter than it once was. That Infester already has gotten maybe, what, 12 or 14 bio units worth of value with that initial fungal and it has enough energy for another one. Let's see if this commitment can work. We had a lot of this with Solar on uh, the defender side of the map. Now, whenever you have Hydralisks uh, not on creep, the retreating is just a lot harder to pull off. If, if, if you start to lose a fight, basically all the Hydras die. So it's important you know when and where you can commit to. But it seems like Solar realized uh, ahead of time that he was not in a safe position and abandoned that uh, and headed back. You know, just going big picture for a second here, this does, uh, this is starting to look like one of those TVZs where it's gonna go into a super late macro game. It seems like Gumiho is gunning for that. Oftentimes when the window closes for Terra to try and get a killing blow in the mid game against the Zerg, then suddenly the fallback plan is for them to try and get four, ideally five bases, because you want those extra ninth and 10th Vespian geysers to really pump you know, enough ghost mech to be able to sustain a cost efficient army. But I, I feel like Solar has so much momentum from the mid game that 
If Gumiho goes for this play, I, I don't know if he's actually going to be able to safely get up to this turtle setup. Even though that Gumiho is one of the players that's the best in the world of playing mech, the transition in a ghost mech from here with Solar having the bank that he has and rapidly expanding across the map, I feel like there are some chances for killing plays coming out from Zerg. I think you might be right. By the way, uh, he's opened up another little avenue here. Um, I don't think there's any way to get around there. It seems like the Zerg is basically boxed out. And another base being taken here, just uh, to the middle of the 6 o'clock position. Nidus Network is being produced right now by Solaris. He's going to try and find another avenue of attack. And I just want to keep going back to this one Infester. It's such a nice addition to the army because it complicates matters so much more for the Terran. And it's such a minimal investment, too. You're going to get the Infestation Pit for Hive. Well, it did seem like for a long time there was just really nothing that Terran could do. Mm -hmm. um, if an immediate, I'm sorry, nothing Zerg could do if an immediate small push from the Terran came out, where now it can be punished instead of just the Zerg trying to put out fires endlessly. I like it a lot. I love the play that we're seeing from Solar right now. And I'm wondering how he's going to try and set up for, you know, the aggressive end game that Zergs tend to favor in a situation like this one, because should this game go extremely big picture, big picture and Gumiho's able to max on Ghost Mech with planetaries and extra command centers and static defense spread out, across the map, it'll be tremendously difficult for Solar to remain cost-effective. I feel like Dark is arguably one of the only Zerg players in the world, maybe Dark and Serral, that can navigate that late game against Terran effectively. So for Solar with his bank, I'm expecting him to start to really ramp up the, uh, the aggression and try and go for a killing blow. But over the past couple of minutes, he hasn't been able to get too much done. We'll see if that changes now with him starting to eye down this three o'clock base yet again. Okay, another attack comes in. Um, this time, it's going to go right up the ramp. By the way, the depot placement a little bit different from what we're normally used to seeing here from uh, Gumiho. Uh, it is driven away. I wanted to mention this earlier, but like it's kind of a cute depot placement. We normally see the depots as these kind of walls, that like a, a barrier that's raised or closed, and he just kind of stacks them together uh, on top of each other. It's the like a sandbag almost. It's weird. Yeah, yeah. It, it's only funny because I feel like we don't see that very often from any Terrans at all. Uh, the counter punch comes in here from Gumiho, but is he uh, too far uh, overextended? It looks like he's going to get a pick up and try to back up as quickly as possible. I think as long as the trades are relatively cost efficient, it should be good for him because he wants to max on more coasts and more siege tanks. He needs to trade out these bio units like Marines and Marauders in ways that are more cost effective, but did he bite off a little bit more than he can chew? Is Solar is now coming in, even a, a drone attacking supply depots in this attack. Oh, and four medivacs getting picked off. This could be huge, but luckily Gubiho reinforcing from the triangle third is able to defend three of them. And now Nukes coming into the play. Gubiho is doing a good job of slowly stabilizing. I thought that Solar might have had enough tempo to start to break him apart, but we're reaching the stage in the game where, you know, Terra, they have enough gas that they could actually start to pump out a very healthy number of ghosts and even the vehicle weapons coming in through in the clutch. And, you know, when you get enough ghosts, suddenly the punishments are huge, right? Mm. They, anytime they retreat, uh, if you're fast enough, of course, the snipe is pretty good. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, it can be tricky for the Zerg. We've had many games we've talked about before where it's basically the, Z the Zerg trying to end the game before the Terran can just soak up their half of the map. I think this game is no exception. Oh, those are some really good mailing connections, though. I think Solar might have gotten five or six ghosts. Yeah, you know what he can shot? do? He's got 5k gas. We could probably remake Banelings at an absurd amount. And we're going to have to watch how much damage the Terran endures over the next couple minutes here um, and what the supply is going to be at the end of that compared to what the Zerg has. Because if you can have, you know, maybe even three or even four Baneling uh, A moves in here and how quickly the Terran supply plummets and how quickly the Zerg can then remax out, Sometimes that's enough to flatten the Terran. I, I think Guiho just might not have enough siege tank production right now. There's only five on the map, and none of them are here in this critical junction. And it seems like he can only produce siege tanks in pairs. So we're going to see this army get cleaned up. But what's important to note is that there's about 50 Zerglings hatching. No doubt there's going to be Banelings made again. The Terran is a quarter out from being maxed. But another attack in. Could, we could see this uh, supply disparity begin to widen even further. 
Yeah, as Gumiho's bank gets lower and lower here, I mean, he's down at 700 minerals with 164 army supply. It becomes a very scary situation, and the creep is even getting ready to knock on his door. And just thinking back on those previous engagements, the lack of siege tanks between the natural expansion and this triangle third has been so damaging for Gumiho because the ghosts are having to split against banelings, and nothing is shooting the banelings from range and finding damage. Now, this engagement going a lot better for Gumiho than previous ones. There is a good fungal on the ghost, but the banelings a little bit too far away to connect. Of course, this is one of the stages of the game where we're talking about the benefits of... Oh, those investors burrowed right now, actually, just outside of scan range. They do not have enough energy for a fungal. Yeah, a bit of a, an interruption there on the baneling morph, but um, this is just going to drive the Zerg a little bit further back. By the way, very top left base has been taken. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we're starting to see Solar really wrap around into every single position, even a Nidus network coming in over here. So the Terran is getting surrounded. And just thinking back on these Infestors, you know, one of the critical interactions that happens in a late game TBZ is Infestors being able to get Fungals on a clump of ghosts so that Banelings can finally connect with them and wipe them off the map. And the fact that the range is a little bit reduced now on the Infestors makes that considerably harder for the Zergs to get done. And you can see that kind of coming into play in the, several of these engagements where Solar is struggling with a handful of Infestors to really get the big fungal connections on the Ghost. And that's allowing Gumiho to stabilize a little bit better. But as you said, Solar, he is consuming the map. He's mining a base in the top left that by rights should belong to Gumiho. That's one of the win conditions here for Zerg. If you can't be as cost efficient as the Terran, then if you're able to take more of the map than the Terran, that disadvantage kind of starts to go away. Well, this small drop going to be pushed out shortly here. Terran now taking the gold base. We're out of bases. No doubt Zerg's going to reclaim the gold that's just, a, you know, a, about a screenshot away from here. But we also have no gas in the bank for Terran. So this is a very different, very stark contrast to the 4K gas in the bank for Solar. Solar probably needs to act pretty quickly here. Obviously, you never know exactly where your opponent's gas is. You always have kind of a maybe a vague idea. Maybe you don't have any idea at all. But we're going to start to see these Hydra Ling Bane moves come in here and damage just spike in these interactions. All right, another big engagement coming in. Hydra's actually almost getting in. Melee Rangers. Solar's going for the full surround, gets a ton of ghosts with those connections. The Hydras just continue to push forward. No fear at all. I think Solar just wants to get the, me the best possible trade with a bank that he's got in Remax. And as you said, Gumiho, his gas is pretty much depleted right now. His army is almost pure ghost siege tank. He's now starting to Remax on a number of Marines because he just needs something to kind of bulwark the defense here. But I'm watching Solar's supply rapidly reach max again. 24 more mainlings in production, another Infestor entering the field. And I don't know if Gumiho can survive a couple more pushes like that. This is starting to look really scary. As you said, gas continues to be the problem. Ever since that previous push that Solar made on the Triangle Third for Gumiho, he has not been mining the gas there. And now taking this gold base, there's only one Vespine Geyser here. I don't even think it's a high yield. So the gas issues for Gumiho, they aren't going to be going away anytime soon. I'm actually surprised he's not lifting this command center between you know, the, the linear the linear third base and the natural expansion is... I would love to see him start to saturate the gas over by that triangle third, but as of yet, I don't know, in, unable to get it. And should Solar start to come in? If he recognized the situation, I think he would be a lot more aggressive in trying to trade out with the Terran. But of course, as you said, it's, it's hard to know when you're playing in the game exactly what the economic setup is of your opponent. Yeah, I look at the numbers at the bottom of the screen, I go, oh, you just need to actually dump your supply into him and damage and trade out a couple times, and you should be able to win. But I think the defensive posture that Solar has right now is actually going to hurt him because it's allowing uh, Gumiho a couple more minutes on the clock to try to get uh, get it together here. But we know inevitably the Zerg is going to attack in. Um, and so here we go now. I mean, a crazy, about 180 degrees of, of attack coming here from the Zerg. So many Banes coming down now. But, you know, the gold base is so heavily fortified with siege tanks in, like, you know, so many different positions, it's kind of impossible to get into. I would not mind seeing the Zerg hit 12 o'clock. I would not mind seeing the Zerg go for a Nidus network or, or go for even, like, a... I guess a drop's kind of out of the question here, just the way this map is shaped. But 
try some alternative approaches because the vast majority of those tanks were over at the gold base, now about half of them over here to try to hit this gold base now. Yeah, oh Gumiho's boy. getting on the aggression. Gonna be dropping a nuke over here at the six o'clock position. We'll see if Solar's able to catch much. He does get the ghost that was going for the nuke. And actually a Lurker transition coming in. I love these Lurkers trying to get into a position over here between this critical junction of the center of the map and those ghosts. Oh, Gumiho's gotta be very careful. So this is what I was talking about. I think a couple more moves like this, if he can make a little bit more progress. Because the reality is, uh, you know, Gumiho's not maxed out. He doesn't have a lot to work with. So if he has to be spread out defending a lot of positions, you're eventually going to find that weak area that Achilles heel, that part uh, in the infrastructure that's exposed and you can hit it really hard. Yeah, Solar with those lurkers is just causing a big problem for Gumiho in terms of, <laughs> he's actually gonna land the commencer over there by that hat. Yeah, that's why not? so funny. By the way, gas uh, situation looking a lot different. You know, we were talking about how we wish that uh, Solar acted a lot sooner because I think he probably had more of a, an opportunity to close the game out. But instead, um, the game's gone on. Terran is still alive. Supplies are much closer. And now they're both fairly even on gas banked up, which is virtually none. Yeah, but Gumiho had to, set, had to send a lot of units back to deal with those lurkers in between the natural and the third base. So that's going to allow Solar to come in for an opening. Does force a lift off on that gold, but unfortunately not really getting the best connections. And now his gas bank almost entirely depleted. And you can really start to feel the momentum in this game shifting as Gumiho just takes cost efficient trade after cost efficient trade. Solar once again coming in. Uh, EMP is going down on the spellcasters here too, and I think Solar is starting to yeah. run out of steam. I, I think he's probably now in a position that's losing, yeah, and then now he cannot recover. GG. Wow. Gumiho just barely threaded the needle in that game. He was so close well, to dying. He for lasted. He lasted long enough. You know, Solar was sitting on so much gas, and when we saw that, like literally, Gumiho has a hundred gas in the bank. And in a second, that goes down to zero. He's spending all his gas. You can actually make Mass Hydra, Ling, Bane Ling, and just flood a couple positions a couple times, drive them back, because those gas geysers for the Terran are drying up. So the exterior bases, the perimeter bases, that's where the future gas is going to be. If you could deny that, all they can make is Marines, maybe Hellions, but you know, over time, especially if you're expanding quickly as Zerk, you could win it. But a lost opportunity there from Solar. Obviously a tough game, easier said than done, but that does give Gumiho a one to zero lead. Solar was in a prime position to try and break that one through though. It was a very closely fought battle on El Cyne. But now we're going to Gumiho's map pick here on Solaris. Is he going to be able to bring the same thing to the table here and close this one out 2-0? Let's find out. Side, solar. So definitely game one, a lot more like what we thought today was going to look like. Some long, dramatic TVZs. Um, game two, I mean, you know, we don't see any SCVs running across the map to make barracks, but we do have a gas being taken right away. Yeah, gas first for solar and command center first for Gumiho. Okay. Um, well, this is a very aggressive build here versus a very greedy build. <laughs> Terran OP from Redwood City. We got a lot I'll of Californians go here today. Yeah. Well, this might end pretty quick. I don't know exactly how this interaction can go, but. Yeah, this is I mean, looking. This is, <laughs> this is, you know, on paper, you just go, well, I mean, you know, how early is the pool? How late is the barracks? Yeah, look at that, that gas timing. I feel like that's something like a. Three minute speed should Solar decide to go for speed. I wonder if this will be some kind of Ravager play instead. Time will tell. Well, I mean, the, but A, you're safe from an, an attack early on. Mm -hmm. But B, I mean, if the Terran's this late, two gases, by the way. Um, let's see if anything can get down here and really do damage. Yeah, four links will be produced. Zergling speed does get fired up, and so Solar's still mining gas, but not as much as before. Yeah. Link speed starts. Uh, 
We need to see, does he get an add-on right away? Does he make one Marine? What's the, the plan? The command center is being built on the low ground, but the Zerglings can't get over there in time to deny it. And a Reaper can deal with Zerglings, at least before they have Ling's speed. So the Reaper is going to finish long before um, Zerglings' speed finishes. But if the command center can get up and Terran could safely defend this, whether that's with a bunker or just having enough units to hold this, I do feel like this is going to be a very good spot here for Gumiho. Yeah, I think it depends on exactly what Solar decides to do aggressively is he only has 50 gas at the bank right now he is slowly mining it and it seems like he is just waiting for that reaper to come across the map so we can get something done and i'm curious how much solar is going to commit because getting a gas that early as zerg against command center first if, if you don't find a way to get damage done it doesn't feel very good getting that gas is expensive even just building the extractor that early it's one drone that's not mining minerals when it could have been and you're doing it against the greediest possible opening Terran can bring to the table in the command center first. So now speed is done. These fourlings are going to come in. They should be able to find at least one or two SCVs. That command center, I would not be surprised if it got lifted off. But is this going to be enough damage here for Solar to justify it? Yeah, he does get probably up to, what, three kills here? Yeah, there's the third. Yeah. But Canceling the depot as well. You know, I feel like Gumio's probably fine. I mean, he's, he's going to get an armory here, too. That's interesting. Kind of an interesting unit Cyclones. interaction. Cyclone's coming out. Will we see a second factory? Is this going to be a mech game? After how crazy that last game was, it's easy for me to forget that, like, Gumiho is the mech god. But, yeah, you can almost bet in any best of three the mech play is going to come out uh, one way or the other. So yeah. he's continuing to cycle out Cyclones in pairs. Yep, there it is. Factory on the tech lab. Oh, I, there was a second factory. I didn't even see that on the production tab for whatever yeah, reason. Yeah, I'm just blind. But no, we're going to have hurricane thrusters coming in. That is the speed upgrade for these Cyclones. And plus one vehicle weapons also underway. Now, it does seem like Cyclones are remarkable at kiting. Oh, they're insane. They're insane. I remember um, back... I Sorry, I don't mean to cut no, you off. No, no, I was just going to say, you know, like uh, you have... Um, stutter step micro and, and you know how impressive that is but it just seems like cyclones especially if the zerk doesn't have the right number of units mm -hmm. you can really lose control of the game very quickly and this looks like it's going to be cyclones i'm guessing with like a hellbat morph uh i i think it's just for plus it just one attack it's... actually okay. I, I think this is more likely to be i mean you're absolutely right it could be a hellbat yeah. push that well, eventually I mean, I, culminates i, I might but... be wrong too i mean I, I, it's always kind of hard to figure out what Gumiho is going to do because he plays so differently. I think this is just going to be battle mech, though. Just kind of taking map control like this, taking favorable trades because these Cyclones, they pack a lot of a punch. I guess if you look at it, all the units from the Terran are so microable. Mm -hmm. Like, Queens can kind of deal. They can kind of hang with this, but they have to burn through their transfuses. And, you know, how long is that going to take to reach in? Yeah, and Solar's going for a lot of roaches to deal with this, and I'm wondering how that is going to scale against... Basically a full battle mech composition here from Gumiho because oftentimes, I mean, it's kind of limited the experience that I've seen CBZs get played on this new patch with the Hurricane Thrusters, but usually what happens when Terran drops their momentum in this matchup if they're going for battle mech is Zerg is going to have a flood of links come in from maybe a 180 degree angle, get us around on the Hellions, get us around on the Cyclones and clean it up that way. But if you're going into Roaches, especially before Roach Speed is done, as Glial Reconstitution only just now beginning. There's a lot of kiting potential for these Cyclones. As you see right here, the Roach is just kind of taking a lot of free damage. So I'm wondering exactly what this response is going to culminate in, what it's going to build up to here for Solar. And I, it is possible that there are multiple ways of dealing with this as an infestation pit is coming down now. Maybe Solar can try and find some way to get a Fungal off on this group of units. It's hard to say because Battle Mech, it, it, oftentimes when we saw it before in the previous patch, it would be something that would kind of play into an all-in. Kira would occasionally go for yeah. Battle Mech, basically all-in type styles, and it worked. It was viable, but given the new patch, the reduced cost of the Cyclone, it's something now that you can go for, but not necessarily commit a lot of resource to. You can open up with it and then transition into a Siege Tank Mech which it seems like Gumiho is doing. Yeah, he's pretty patiently going into that uh, siege tank mech now. Um, the third base is set up uh, before the fourth base finishes. So Gumiho kind of 
using that map presence, forcing a lot of roaches out here and then disengaging entirely. Um, and you know, that's the thing. You could already just see from the way the cyclone can move and the roach can move that you can basically kite this uh, forever unless they, it's a position where the Terran has oh. to try to hold his ground. We've got a siege tank in the back over here. You know, the Hellions are, are basically expendable at this point in time. And look at this. Um, I think had those not been blocked by the Hellbats, he could have just pursued that even further. And it's been a pretty comfortable game here from Gumiho. Now, Gumiho, because he's done this off and on for a while, you know, it, it's kind of cool to see it in this version of the patch because the Cyclones have a little bit more of a functional role. But I got to say, this does not look bad here for Gumiho. No, it looks rock solid. And for Solar, it is going to be a couple of Infestors. I think he might have made two or three in total, but just look at the cost efficiency right now. That was, I think, 1,000 more res. The Hellions are also going to spot the Infestors, so Gumiho's going to have that on his mind. These Hellions should be able to find a handful of drones, but really the trades have not been cost effective for Solar at all. And looking at the supplies right now, you might think that Solar is in a fine position and possibly even in an advantageous one, but those supplies are massively inflated by Ravagers and Roaches, which are, you know, some of the least supply efficient yeah. units in the game. So it's Solar is going to have to find a way to trade these out in a way that is effective. And I think that's going to be hoping he can find an angle where Gumiho is unprepared and catch him with fungal growth because Cyclones, although they excel at kiting, they are relatively brittle if you can get on top of them. They do not have a lot of HP. Yeah, no, they're, they're, they're pretty um, fragile units if they can ever get cornered. Um, but it does seem like this is a game where you sort of lead the Zerg into ramping up the supply of Roach Ravager and then play around it by having siege tanks that you can leapfrog in with this like really microable set of, um, you know, Hellbats and, and Cyclones that are just sort of dealing damage the whole time. Very punishing right now for the Zerg. The Infestors are going to get fractioned off from the rest. One goes down, the other one wow. will go ahead to the safety of the uh, expansion. But, like, I don't know, man. I, it just doesn't seem like this is a position where Solar's going to be able to regain ground very quickly. I know there's a lot of roaches uh, that are going to hatch in a second here, and maybe that changes it. We also do have a greater spire coming. But I think this hatchery is going to go down, and it doesn't seem like the Zerg can fight uh, and try to take a position that's too deep into this uh, line of tanks that extends off the screen here towards the left. Yeah, one of the key interactions here is the Ravagers coming forward to try and bile down the siege tanks and one-shot them and then they retreat. But with Cyclones, their new maneuverability, even though their leash range is not as high as it used to be when they lock on, they just shred roaches, they shred Ravagers. And every time that Solar is pushing forward to try and bile down, these siege tanks, he's bleeding a lot of units, and he is going to catch the Terran army mostly on siege. But I mean, as soon as two siege tanks get fortified there, I mean, look at how the tanks can kind of snake around and set up another really wide tank line here. Yeah. And, and the Zerg could come through with the corrosive vials and try to get those connections, but a lot is sacrificed on the Zerg's end. Now, we saw that base down at the bottom get denied. It looks like it's going to be denied again. There it is now. Uh, but. If the Zerg loses one more base, it's Terran four base to Zerg three base. Again, if the Zerg loses a base. It looks like there's two pretty tempting spots to try to attack into. We have Broodlords morphing in, but only a handful of them, and Thor production is already underway here for Gumiho, so... Everything seems to be going Terran's way. I, I kind of feel like Solar is just getting beating it every single turn right now. The mech army continues to march forward. These Cyclones very low on HP, but Gumiho's done an excellent job of keeping them alive. And Dude, every single engagement is so insanely cost efficient I mean, for Gumiho. You could, you could just, just say wild. that like, you know, this mech style clearly just beats Roach Ravager. Like, I don't know if Zerg should ever go down this path. We had a Cyc we had two Cyclones go up that ramp and I think kill a Broodlord, by the way, during yeah, all that too. Crazy. It's just insane. It's now, the Broodlords are the saving grace here because yeah. nothing here can really easily deal with that. But, you know, you're now stuck on this Roach Ravager Broodlord. There's Thors coming. We know Thors can deal with Broods. Oh, move command right here for Gumiho. That's oh, a no. big throw. He needed those Cyclones and Hellions to move alive. That might actually change this game a little bit here on its yeah, head. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, we got to see what damage these Broodlords can do. He's going to do a big counterattack right up to basically where the rallies would come out. That separates the attacking units away from the base we just saw on the bottom right. Thors are going to come out now. If the Thors can gun down the Broodlords, 
then I think he's going to be okay because I think he can just muster out enough. But it looks like Solar has a lot in this game. I mean, the abducts right there on Suit Thors were massive. Eventually, the Brew Lords will still go down, but I think Gumiho just kind of move commanding his Cyclone army into the Roach Ravager might have spelled disaster for yeah. this game. It looked like he yeah. was in such a good position. I, I, I think the game would have gone on had he not lost that big group of units at the top. Yeah, I mean, just imagine how much more micro potential he would have had against this. It's crazy, because, like, he basically got Zerg just up to the brink of death, and then the Zerg got the Broodlords out. It's like, okay, I've held it off. Now we need to do the, the, the counterattack. We need to try to push it into our own damage. And that's what Gumio had. I don't know what was going on. Bad hotkey. Um, whatever it is, he had these units right-clicked somewhere when they probably should have been A-clicked. So move command instead of attack command. Lost a lot. Yeah, and those Cyclones are the units that you need to control the Roaches and Ravagers yeah. by hiding them. The, and the, there was enough Thors to take on the Broodlords, but there was enough on the ground and there was nothing there to kite like the Cyclones. So here we go. Now we're into game three. Yeah, a bit of an overextension there for Gumiho and some Miss Micro on top as well as the game was looking really good for him. I wonder if we're going to see him go back to that style on Hecate because I feel like if he executes it correctly, against the response that Solar showed in game number two. It should translate into a win. He just seems to have everything going for him, but Gumiho, he is a wild card. What is he going to bring to the table here in the final map? Gumiho. On side, Solar. Yeah, what kind of game is Gumiho going to bring here? Uh, or, or is Solar going to be the one that takes the initiative? We know that typically in a uh, TVZ, it's usually the Terran who's going to dictate the, the pace of the game, and the Zerg surveys, stays back, and responds tries to cut corners uh, or, or make a bunch of units to defend. It just depends. But, um, you know, in that game, it really was one where the Terran was right up to the finish line as far as winning and then just did not control a huge amount of units. And Hellions and uh, Cyclones, if, if they get in a bad position and they're right-clicked through units, they'll all just die. Especially against Roaches and Ravagers. They yeah. have a lot of DPS. Is yeah, the advantage they have is they can play keep away. They can kite the other units and, and then try to, you know, accumulate a lot of damage onto the other units over time. But um, it did seem like Gumiho was right up to that moment, ready to, 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 to keep it, the Zerg either behind on bases or even, and then just counterattack the Broodlords with the Thors and then fill that right right back into the original unit comp of Cyclone Tank um, uh, Hellion. Yeah, I'm right there with you. It certainly felt like Gumiho had played the mid-game masterfully. He was taking cost-efficient trades. He repeatedly shut down the fourth base, and although he didn't get any direct economic damage done besides really denying that base, I guess the Roach Ravager comp that Solar was running, those Cyclones, they got so much incredible value, but you know, the one real vulnerability for Gumiho in that moment is when the Brood Lords do pop, because you actually right. do need to have Thors there for the anti-air. And the Thor is, when they're dealing with the Broodlords, they need support on the ground to allow them to actually deal with the air. Otherwise, everything falls apart. And so Gumiho just kind of had one, one of the worst Miss Micros you can have and the worst possible moments that you can have. I'm very curious if Solar would have actually been able to succeed with that attack if Gumiho did not go for that Miss Micro because it seemed like everything was kind of coming together in that one final push for the Zerg. It was really his last big chance, I think, to get something done. And I mean, we're never going to know exactly what those no. armies would have looked like had they clashed at their full potential. But maybe we'll get a bit of a recap on that again, because Gumiho once again here on Hecate in map number three, he went for command center first and a double gas. He's going for a very fast star report, the factory. Gonna build a Hellion, two Marines, and then I wouldn't be surprised if we switched add-ons. And no, actually, it's a second barracks coming yeah. in from Gumiho. Yeah, so and look, he puts that way in the bag. He knows that there is, uh, you know, it, it's not clear mm -hmm. from the Zerg's perspective what is Gumiho gonna do. And so he hides uh, a tech lab way in the back. 
There's a Stargate also being made in the front. Whenever you see Barracks, Factory, Stargate, or Starport, excuse me, you never know what kind of game you're going to get. You would expect it to be Mass Marine with infantry, but you don't know for sure with Gumiho. And we've even seen a couple games where he's gone for infantry and then ditches it into Mac. Yeah, sometimes if Terrans identify that they're going into a situation where they really can't win the game with Bio, it, it's a slow transition in the mech that can stabilize things. Oh. But Solar with the clutch scout actually spots the Tech Lab Barracks. So he's going to know straight away that it's Bio and Solar's play against Bio, it, it's pretty solid, I have to say. I feel like I'm much more confident in Solar's abilities of dealing with a Gumiho Bio style than a Gumiho mech style. And the fact that his hand is revealed this early in the game, I'm liking that scout for Solar. That's a clutch scout. And I, I feel like that's even a scout that Solar probably wouldn't do against most Terran opponents, sacrificing the Overlord like that. But against Gumiho, yeah. he is such a wild card. It was a smart move to try to get in there. And so now you know you're against uh, you know a very classic uh, opening here from uh, the TVZ. It's going to be Marines roaming moving around as best they can, cleaning up creep tumors, doing damage, picking up in the medevacs when they uh, you know, can't hold their ground any longer. Yeah, no stim pack, so these Marines not gonna try and trade out with the Queens whatsoever, just gonna lift right back up into their medevac, because the third command center also going to get thrown down. Relatively quick here for Gumiho, it's... Yeah, quick, but not the quickest for sure. Yeah, it's kind of in the middle. Sometimes we'll see players open with something like a 3-1-1 or Go for that command center very quickly. Yeah, you get Biani makes five more axes and then makes the command center later on. Um, and so, look, I mean, this isn't good or bad. It's kind of uh, very middle of the road. Um, and, you know, the Zerg needs to treat it as such in, in this game. Don't over defend because then the, the Terran gets the third base up easily and you can't punish. Don't under defend because this is enough out on the map that you can do some real damage with this. Yeah, if Solar is caught out of position, and let's not forget, the first map played on Alcyone, Kumiho was able to win with Bioplay, and he did a great job of it. Kumiho oh my God. actually catching Solar out of position, going to get a good number of drones, but the split so far have been solid. Only four, in fact, going yeah, down. Yeah, that was actually unreal. That's about the, as... The, 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 more drones were not killed there. Yeah, that's about as well done as it could have been, given the circumstances, and part of it's also Solar's excellence in City. I love the double evolution chamber blocking off. It's almost like a, a PVT wall in <laughs> the way you build a, the gateway in the Cybernetic Core to block the Hellions or the Reapers from being able to navigate as those Reapers, the Hellions, excuse me, were not able to find much of an angle there on the third base for Solar, so. Nice play. Yeah, not bad at all. Infestation Zerg. pit now coming in for Zerg as Gumiho is going to go for a three mana back drop in the main base. So let's see how much damage this can do. There are Zerglings here, but not enough Zerglings to where it's going to scare the Terran away from the spot. And this could actually be a lot of damage because I'm pretty sure Zerg didn't expect the drop this big to come in here. Yeah, so we're getting caught out of position a couple of times. And there's going to be a cost-efficient trade for Gumiho, but not too much damage done economically. Oh, Solar with these Queens. Oh, got to be careful. Almost another moment where you right-click right through a bunch of damage. Mm -hmm. Solar is one of these Zergs, by the way. Just I'm always continuously impressed with his micro, specifically his Queen micro. Whether he's playing a ZVT or a ZVP, he always seems to be on the intercept with Queens, trying to catch units like Oracles, like Medivacs. It's one of his calling cards, too, and of course I say that, okay, I was, I was worried that he was going to immediately lose a bunch of queens after I say this, <laughs> but luckily he was paying attention. I know those moments. You're <laughs> like, well, this guy's actually so good at his control, and the medevacs <laughs> fly into a bunch of <laughs> uh, stuff that kills him. Um, well, we're getting the Zerg's fourth base up. Terran is going to push in here. I don't think it's going to get much done, unless the control is insane. It is three tanks. I guess it depends on where he decides to place those tanks. This high ground area where the grass is looks pretty tempting. Maybe you could try to line that up and basically make this um, set up where you try to fish the Zerg's army in, let them take a lot of siege tank flows. Actually, the standing army for Solar does not look very scary. Unless he's able to get a clutch fungal with this Infester and land some vials on it. All right, he's getting a pretty good spread with his siege tanks here. Yeah, I think this hatchery is gonna go down. Well, that if it goes down, it's huge. Zerg is staying back, and, you know, we don't have a lot of, well, I guess we have some uh, morphine units here, but not the kind where it's going to really matter that much. Yeah, Yeah. there's no there's just no way. It's so, just so fast that, lurker. That's pretty big. Now, 
we've said, I mean, we've been casting StarCraft 2 forever here at GSL, but we've talked about this before. Sometimes games just end where the Zerg loses the fourth base a couple times. And it's like, yeah, you're just never going to win the game on three bases. A Terran can just keep what they've got, defend your counterattacks, and then just push into the next new place. That's that's pretty good. This is a unique style that Solar is coming through with. Really fast, high lurkers, no Banelings nest whatsoever. Wasn't he almost even skipped the Hydras? You know, we, we barely saw any Hydralisks yeah. on the map before the lurker transition. Yeah, I was a little bit thrown off by the, the tech itself there. Um, I think it would have looked a lot better had the lurkers been done to protect the fourth base, but now it's going to be a little bit more of a difficult game. You got to be careful with those lurkers, though, before the hive tech upgrades are done. Once they get that range, they become a lot more effective. Right. Than before uh, then. We've got a drop headed towards the main as there's a push down here at the fourth base. And I don't see anything to defend the main. Yeah, everything right now is just trying to intercept this army here. I think Solar might be underestimating how much Gumio has in all these drones. We're retreating back behind the mineral line. A lot of them might get sniped off. Dude, this is a lot uh, here for the Terran. And I mean, the, the engages are not that great. He's a little bit spread out, Gumio is. But this should allow for a pretty good push. Yeah, we're going to see this come right now. And he's not just going for the bottom right. It looks like he wants to maybe hit the third and wedge in between. No, he's going to pick up and send another drop of the same size back into the main. Yeah, I think he's identifying that Solar is going to try and play this Hive Lurker style. And as Solar is getting these Lurkers out, it's hard for him to have much of a standing army to really run around and intercept these drops, especially with basically no Hydras on the field at all. So if Gumiho can ex exert a lot of pressure on the fourth base here for Solar and commit commit Solar to defending this position. And suddenly that triple drop in the main. Oh, Fungals getting paired up with the Biles there. But Very the good. The dodge is pretty good. A big drop here in the main. Yeah, when you go for this Lurker tag, sometimes you can just kind of avoid where the Lurkers are. Mm -hmm. And you'll find there's a lot of weak positions that can't really easily be defended. The tanks are going to spread out. I, I just don't think that, you know, you can afford to lose this base here. As Solar. Oh, my God. Oh. The Hive just got taken out by this drop. Guiho with a Solary just knew he was gonna be able to pull Solar all the way down to that fourth base. And I feel like you were almost premonition when you called. We see Zergs often lose games when they yeah. just keep losing their fourth base. And that was basically Guiho's game plan there was to leverage a ton of pressure on the fourth, force Solar to commit everything to defending it. And as you said, Lurkers, they aren't very mobile, especially this early on in the game when you only have a handful of them. We only have four Lurkers right now on the map. I mean, the only thing that Solar has right now is a big army that has been unable to defend his other bases. So we have the a third base being remade. Again, you know, with the Hive Tech destroyed, it really starts to add complications. There's nothing even comparable for Terran or, or Protoss that you could put in the same level as losing that Hive. I mean, that's about as clutch of fungal as you could possibly get, but it still doesn't matter as the Bio stims forward. A ton of Ravagers and Hydras getting taken out, and... Solar, even in his economy, he's he's basically on two bases right now. He's just saturating what would have been the triangle third. He's not rebuilding the hatchery in the main base because it's mostly mined out. Now just only at this moment throwing it down. And I don't know how Solar is going to be able to handle these pushes. Now most of these siege tanks are unseized. This is about as good an engagement as Solar is possibly going to be able to get. The Biles even yeah, this coming is, down. This is going to be but it. GG. Gumio takes it two to one. Giving us a TVT here in the winner's match with Gumiho versus Cure. The tongue is out. Tongue is out. That's when you know he's focused. Interesting style there from Solar in, in game three. I don't think I've seen that ZVT style from him very much at all, really. And Gumiho just knew exactly what to do, and he picked him apart. Well, Gumiho really honestly played a lot better than Solar. I know Solar won game two, but you know, if you go back and just see the moment where Solar dropped the ball, or um, Gumiho dropped the ball with a bad A move. Honestly, I mean, Gumiho is looking just really scary, really strong. Guys, short break. When we return, Gumiho versus Kier, the winner is the first to go to the round of four here in season three of the GSL Codass.
the tiger, I'm a fighter. I'm a fight. Yeah. I'm the one that's on fire. They gotta honor me. Call me by your sire. I'm the truth with the proof. They a goddamn liar. Head hunter, underdog on the come up. I always stand my ground. I dare you to run up. I run and done you. Move like the thunder. The world will know my name. I'm a world wonder. Anytime, any place. Anytime, any place. Anybody, it don't matter. Anywhere, any day. Anytime, any place, any time, any time, any place, anyone, anybody, where you at, any day, you can't run, anytime, I'm right here, any place, right now, anybody, anybody, anybody. any day, yeah, ah. heavy in the game and I can't be contained, the greatest in the history, the world to know my name, any man, anywhere, anybody, it don't matter, I'll be right there, I am the tiger, strength of a bear, king of the jungle, you better stand clear, be aware, your surroundings when I walk inside the room, no mercy for the weak, you know what I came to do, nah, anytime, any place, anytime, any place, anybody, it don't matter, anywhere, Anytime, any place, any time, that's my slow, any place, any day, anybody, anywhere, any day, right now, any time, yeah, you know, any place, what you want, anybody, right now, any day, any day. I can't change my evil ways, my evil ways, my evil ways, my evil ways. Skeletons in my closet There's monsters underneath my bed And there's voices in my head I can't stop them They're calling out, calling out for me Welcome to my dark side It feels good to be the bad guy You know I like to play A cold and dangerous game My soul just can't be saved I can't change my evil to my dark side to my dark side It feels good to be the bad guy You know I like to play Cold and dangerous game My soul just can't be saved I can't change my evil way
똑같은 하루에서 답답함을 빼면 더 청량해질 거야. 제로처럼. 우리 없어도 되는 건 빼고 살자. 실성 사이다 제로. 우주급 텐션 최고의 토킹 하시엑스 토킹. 청량한 이 순간 칠성사이다로부터 칠성사이다 똑같은 하루에서 답답함을 빼면 더 청량해질 거야 제로처럼 우리 없어도 되는 건 빼고 살자 실성 사이다 제로 청량한 이 순간 실성 사이다로부터 실성 사이다 우주급 텐션 최고의 토킹 핫식스 토킹 귀엽고 잘생겼어요 아이돌 상이라서 우와 행복이 느껴지고 단순한 머리는 약할 것 같다 똑 부러지는 모습을 본 적이 없어가지고 요리도 엄청 잘하고 동생이니까 뭐 부려먹기도 쉽고 다시 키고 저는 편안하게 좀 하고 싶습니다 Today's magic Cure DRG, Gumio, Solar, Round of Eight, Group A. Africa TV, Freak Up Studio, live. 2023 GSL Season 3. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. We're free from the chains of TVZ, at least for now. <laughs> Um, Gumio versus Kira, Terran versus Terran is coming up next after that. DRG versus Solar, our Zerk versus Zerk. We will close the night out in a TVZ no matter what, though. So don't worry. We're going to go back into that matchup and continue to unpack the role of the Cyclone. Maybe we'll see if Kira has any new crazy builds if he loses to Gumio here now. But, um, you know, the Cyclone pre-patch, I think, played the biggest role actually in TVT. There were a lot of different rushes and defenses that were centered around the Cyclone. And there may be new rushes and I don't know, maybe even new defenses centered around the new Cyclone now. Yeah, it mixes things up quite a bit in terms of the early openings. And having gotten too much of a chance to see players on the land like Gumiho and Cure of their caliber, I feel like GSL is really the first truly major tournament to take place on the new patch with the new maps. but. Both these players, if you want to understand TVT, these guys are at the top of their game. Cure has been so solid all around, and Gumiho, I was even surprised. I thought he might have won one of the GSL seasons earlier this year. He was yeah. in such good form. I was hearing that a lot of pros were afraid of playing him in TVT. Unfortunately, it didn't work out, but historically, he's looking good. Let's see if he's going to look good against Cure here as we start the winner's match of Group A. So I've been very curious about TVT in general with the new patch. And I think we've got two excellent guinea pigs with different play styles to kind of see how they, they play against each other, how they interact. 
And I feel like this is about as good as it's gonna get. Gumiho and Cure for this GSL at least. Cure has been such a good up and coming player for so long now in terms of his skill. Rising from GSL season to GSL season and Gumiho, as you said, I mean, he's always been such a wild card. Even dating back to his very beginnings in StarCraft 2, he used to play random, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Was, wasn't he random in like the first GSL that he played in or something like that? I think it was GSL 2. GSL 2. It was but... the second GSL he had, but yeah, he was the one guy who was random that qualified. And, you know, honestly, it's I know we all know that random's a thing if we ladder, but it's easy to forget you could even actually do that. Yeah. Um, no one's really able to well, the, do it at a pro level these days. The rules with Star Leaks are always you have to pick a race and play the race through that you entered in. And this was an old idea that was uh, built out in like very early StarCraft 1 because they had issues where people would try to change races. And then it was like, well, who picks what? Or like if you rock, paper, scissors, and then like that guy <laughs> gets the race pick against you. So they made that decision uh, early on. And, and I think it's better for the brand of the player where it's like, no, which one do you play? Like, or what are you going to win the tournament with? You can't just, like, pick based off map or matchup or player. Um, and uh, I feel like a lot of people on, on Reddit and other places found this out much later on when they found out other players that wanted to play and couldn't uh, race pick. But it's been around forever. Um, so, yeah, for him to do random, he had to, like, show up with random the whole way through. Yeah, and qualify with it. He had to play every single tournament match with it. Exactly. He could not go back to tear in his... Oh, Gomu actually come up, coming out with a Concussive Shell Marauder opening off of a fast expansion. And just, just to close that idea out, and that's mm -hmm. why it was crazy when Flash came back in ASL and won with random. Yeah. He was random the whole way through. I mean, imagine start to finish. We need to get Maru to do that. <laughs> I just feel bad for everybody that had to play against Flash is random and he randoms Terran. Yeah, no, that happened like... a couple times where I'm like, oh my god, that's right. You can random into Terran and now it's Flash with an advantage. This is horrible. <laughs> and it happened a lot. Uh, I, I wonder if we will ever get any StarCraft 2 players try to do that again at the pro level. I know that Clem in Europe, I, I think he probably has the best off race. His Protoss yeah. off race is like top 16 on GM, I think pretty much always. I think it's the MMR, this is hazy, so I might be wrong, guys, but I think he's like 6.3K or something so absurd. Crazy. You're like that good with one race, and you're like, also. Yeah, when I actually started like playing StarCraft 2 again quite often and learning builds, I was watching Clem's games as pro. <laughs> <to learn, laughs> That's so funny. Learn from him. That's how good Clem is with everything. And by the way, I, I just want to go for the record here. Gumio is still building Marauders. This is kind of a crazy build yeah, that I was is very not cool. expecting. And I wonder if this is him trying to blind counter the Cyclones a little bit because they so. can't really kite. The Concussive Shell, I don't think. I haven't really seen this interaction in a TVT just I yet. Know. If you cover the IDs up, you're like, oh, wow, Gumiho's red Cyclones are coming out on the map. <laughs> yeah. But actually, uh, back at home, it's going to be a lot of Stim Rotters. Now, Stim's not done yet, right? No, I think it's just Concussive Shell. Yeah, Stim's about 75% done. The fifth or the sixth of Marauder is about to enter the field. And we'll see this initial engagement. All right, here we go. Marauders versus Cyclones. How does this one go? I guess yeah. you can just slow them down enough. And the Cyclones actually doing surprisingly well here. I thought this would be much better for Gumiho than... All you need is one shot to connect. Mm -hmm. One shot kill guarantees the kill pretty much. But I, I honestly thought that that would be a better trade yeah. for Gumiho. I'm not ashamed to admit that I haven't seen a lot of... Concussive Shell Marauder versus Cyclone <laughs> Openings Clash on the new patch. It does seem like if you had just the, one of the other Marauders like fork a shot off and hit the other Cyclone, so you're slowing down two at a time. It's so tough, though. I know, I know. It's like, it's one of those things you, you can say it and it's easier, but to try to actually do it, uh, not so much. Um, another push comes out here. This time, Kira moving down, chasing out the Cyclone. Um, of Gumiho. Oh, now here with this, with a almost what said a stimmed medevac. But I guess that basically is what it turns into when you boost. With a medevac with speed, that does kind of change the math a little bit because that plus stim, you're able to chase down these units. Kira does not have a medevac to lift anything up, so he's going to need the siege tank to anchor the position, and indeed it does. But almost feels like Kira's moving in maybe too soon. It doesn't feel very safe. But hold on, Gumiho insta picks up. Is this impulsive or is this genius? Um, Cure is pulling away. I don't believe Cure had any idea that there was a pickup. Although, 
We do see Gumiho scan the path that way mm. that Kira would head back home to defend. Oh. And instead, he goes in for an intercept. Oh, this is so sick by Gumiho. He's going to get a siege tank for that. This is really good. What an awesome play. And now Gumiho can kind of just pivot around the map and try and find another angle to get some harassment done. And behind this, he's going for a third command center. This is cool. I, w I was not expecting macro marauder openings in TDT, yeah. but I, it does make sense now seeing the way they interact with a Cyclone and what you're able to get done against pushes like this because uh, he's going to get another depot too. There's just a lot of damage coming through. Well, actually disables on both the medevacs, so these will in fact get cleaned up. Some quick thinking there from Cure. Yeah, really nicely done by, uh, by Cure, honestly. I mean, he's held this off pretty nicely, but Gumiho gets his expansion up and running. You know, when there's that much action on that side of the map, you don't have a whole lot of time to, you know, recover and respond. And Gumio is going to stay active on the map. He's going to move out again. It does seem like Kira's traded a little bit better. I think that last trade was good for him, but keep in mind, Gumiho was able to pick off a good number of Cyclones. That's a lot of production time on the factories. And he got that Siege Tank, and he's going to get even more Cyclones here. The Marauder's actually trying to stim forward and get the additional Cyclone, and in fact it does. I would love to see the Units Lost tab right now here for Gumiho as I feel like it's absolutely in his favor. Now, Kira does have these Ravens and three Siege Tanks, so with the Interferix Matrix, he should be able to push Gumiho out of this position, but Gumiho is instead going to go to the main base, and there is not a lot here to defend. That third missile turret was not yet completed, and now there's Stim Bio here in the main base. That Siege Tank about to pop might get sniped, depending on how it rallies out. Yeah, really nice auto turrets, but Gumio pulls away. Continuing to dish out a decent amount of damage. The two medevacs here still alive, so if he needs to pick up, he can pull away and do that. Really so good control here. Seven uh, infantry already killed off. It looks like the last mm. medevac doesn't get out, so no more threats there in the main, but the fourth base is coming down, and. It is true, man. Sometimes the best um, you know, defense is a good offense. Yeah, Cure hasn't been able to get really anything done on Gumiho's side of the map this entire time. And although Gumiho, that wasn't a very militarily efficient trade, he did lose two medevacs and a fair number of bio units there trying to get that harassment done in the main base. He's at the 74 SCVs now, so the 58 workers of Cure. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't even think Cure has a fourth command center on the way. I'm looking at the mini map. I don't see anything boxy enough to be a CC. So, Gumiho is playing a very harassment and macro oriented style. And I got to say, if the names were covered right now, I would totally think that it was Gumiho on the defensive trying oh, to make yeah. Cyclones <laughs> and Siege Tanks work. And Cure playing this aggressive macro bio style. But instead, it's the opposite. And now Gumiho, you know, he, he has some cost inefficient trades with his army, but look at this, what well, he's been able to macro up with this overpowering eco he has set up back at home. Yeah, you're completely right, State. It really looks like, you know, they, they it's like that movie Face Off, right? Where they, <laughs> they change faces and this time it's Gumiho's face for secure. Like, this is crazy. The fact that we've got, um, oh, hold on. Another big attack comes in. Here, gonna drive Gumiho away. Yeah, but the fact that it was uh, Cure going for a bunch of uh, Cyclones out here and it was Gumiho trying to maneuver around and the coward counter that. With Marauders of all units. Yeah. Now, the one big advantage that Cure has in these engagements is interfere Spatrix on those Ravens. He can disable the Siege Tanks if the opportunity presents itself and potentially take a good trade. And in fact, that's what he's going to do with the Siege Tank on the high ground does unsiege in time, but the one on the low ground will fall, and this is going to allow Cure to kind of bunny hop his way into a very dangerous position. This is really far forward right now. He's going to siege up. Marine's coming in on the flank, but is there going to be enough here for Gumiho? I don't think so. Yeah, I think Cure might have actually pierced his defenses, and now the last tank is going to fall. Meanwhile, Cure has so much. Uh, I mean, this is huge right now. The tank count far superior here for Cure as he continues to advance in this position. The tank's gonna siege up again. This time, some of those tanks even in range of the other tank. Yeah, Medivac's lifting up the SCVs to try to evac them from this situation. Now, there are some Vikings out here for Gumiho, but he really has to focus on just stopping this push in its tracks. The Ravens, I believe they did fall during all of that battle, so no more interference matrix. And actually, Gumiho is just going to stim and pull the SCVs and try and break this. I think that's a mistake. Yeah, I don't think it's going to work. And now we've got some more tanks here in the back. 
uh, continuing to get pushed further and further away here from Gumiho. Keep in mind, a drop into the main is also a very real threat. And you can see already Gumiho is starting to wrap some of his infantry around it just to preempt that. But at wherever uh, Gumiho is going to go, Kira's just going to try to go in the opposite direction. Another move out! Now, Gumiho coming in once again, and it's Stimmerine against Stimmerines. The oh. upgrades are mostly equal, but Kira just with the overwhelming mass and the better arc is just going to be able to wipe the floor with all these SMEs, all these Marines. And the supplies, they're very even, but I like the way that Kira is playing this one right now. I mean, he's getting so much damage done on Gumiho. Gumiho's worker lead has completely evaporated, and he is so on the back foot. And plus, these barracks trying to rally down into the natural expansion. The Marines just keep getting shelled by the siege tanks here on the low ground. Yeah, and, and you know, until these tanks are taken out, these Marines are driven out. There's no way to recover this position. Look, he's so good at staying on top of the scans. Kira is so... Uh, perfect when it comes to preemption. The main still dealing, uh, getting dealt a lot of damage, more infantry coming down. We do have another base fresh out of the oven there at the top left. No mules, no SCVs mining from that for now. Kibiho trying to stabilize. Uh, these Vikings are really assisting that quite a bit. Having these Vikings to secure vision and man, Gumiho, that's a big play. Three or four full medevacs moving cross map immediately. Cure is unaware and Gumiho perhaps maybe second-guessing himself a little bit. He brought them back for a moment and then decided to fully commit. Well, he did have success earlier when he tried to pick up and, and move around, and he actually yeah. ended up getting that flank off on the tank. I don't know if he can do it this time around. Um, but you can see that really Kira hasn't expanded into what would be the weaker area, right? He didn't expand up into 12 and, um, you know, eventually 1 o'clock. Instead, he's sort of stayed... Um, onto the right side of the map in growth. And so it's hard to actually go around this big pushing army. And he's going to push in again. He may try to go for the main once more. If he can anchor a position down at the triangle third and lift into the main base, that's going to be really oh. tough for Gumiho to deal with. And that seems like it's exactly what he's going to try and do. Only one siege tank here for Gumiho in the main as he's posturing outside the third base and looking for a counterattack of his own. Actually, Gumiho, I think he's going for a base trade. Look at this yeah. on the map. Gumiho is just going to try to see what he can do, but already so much of the infrastructure is going to be damaged. Meanwhile, there's enough siege tanks here, I think, to meet comfortably the uh, counterattack here from Gumiho, but Gumiho takes another huge counterattack up here. Yeah, another really big stim coming through. I don't think there are any medevacs assisting this army that's attacking the third base, but Gumiho will be able to take it out. Supplies massively in favor of Cure right now as he's going to try and hold on to the defense between the natural expansion and the third. Gumiho was eventually able to clean up the attack in his main base, but now the natural expansion is vulnerable. Gumiho once again hunting for another base to take down, but at the end of the day, I'm starting to like Cure's position more and more. As these economies slowly dwindle, the army supply is going to matter significantly more. And actually, Gumiho, he's fixated on that high ground base, and in fact, it's the attack coming in from the yeah. top side. Cure able to clean him up. I mean, those tanks were too exposed, but Honestly, once Kira got the tank set up inside the, uh, what, where they, they could hit the main and the Marines were able to drop there, like that's so much damage for what you're producing. At that moment, it's totally acceptable for Kira to throw SCVs into the fight just to trade it out so he can remake those SCVs later and stabilize his position. So for now, it's going to be a one to zero uh, lead for Kira. Interesting build coming out from Gumiho, though. I love the Marauder opening. That was five or six Marauders with Medivacs. Fast concussive shell in his stem was able to get some good value early for Gumiho. But one of the problems with an opening like that one is you don't have Interference Matrix. You don't have two Ravens the same way that Kira did. And although Kira was battered and bruised in the early game, once he moved across map in the mid game, you can really demolish a defensive position with Interferix Matrix as the attacking player as Cure just did. And you can see Gumiho, once those siege tanks got disabled, he really had no answer for the full push, for full push coming in from Cure. And that was kind of the domino just starting to fall that led to his defeat. I wonder if he'll go for a similar opening there in game number two. We'll have to wait and see what Gumiho brings. To game two now, match point cure. One map went away from heading to the semifinals. Gumiho.
secure. Okay. Um, I, I really am still surprised at how weird the openings were, I guess, for what we were expecting. Where it was like Gumiho preempting Cyclones and the Cyclones coming from Cure. I don't know if it's going to happen again. I don't know how widespread mass Cyclone usage is in TVT yet here in Korea with these players. Time will tell. I think it's trending upwards. The Cyclone's a very good unit still in terms yeah. of its all-around defensive capabilities, but it falls off in the mid-game. So there's something to be said about blind countering it as Gumiho did. I would be curious to see how Gumiho's Marauder opening with Medivacs would line up against really any other opening that Kira might have done because it's something that we don't see too often here in Korea, these Marauder openings in TVT. But I wouldn't be surprised if one or both players opted for Cyclones just to solidify the early game. It's no longer the Swiss Army knife of defense that it once was in the pre-patch, but still having something with a moving shot with a six range that leashes all the way up to nine and has fairly reasonable DPS at a low cost that you're able to produce out of a reactor factory quite early. It's one of the best all-around units you can make in a TVT starting out where there isn't too much that can just catch you off guard and get game ending damage in, right? So if you want to get into the mid game safely, it's a great way to open up. Yeah, it does seem like there's a lot you can do early on with it. There's a lot of, you know, it's like if, if they're not going to respect it and be ready for it, there's just so much that you can put them through. Now, this Reaper actually loses the duel, kind of insane. Um, and so Cure has another another small victory, a little feather in his cap. Um, and we are going to have Gumiho open up with the uh, the first Cyclone coming out now. Actually, a Hellion here for Cure first. As both players have their command centers underway, Gumiho and Cure both building them on the low grounds is... I don't think Cure should be able to get too much done with his Hellion and two Reaper push, but no, I am I think curious. You're right. Because Gumiho did lose that opening Reaper, right? And the Cyclone does kind of anchor the defense here on the low ground quite well. So we'll see Cure start to push forward. Maybe if that SCV had RNG'd its way all the way up to the top left of the command center, he would have been able to pick it off, but not this time. Okay, does shoot down one Cyclone, gets the revenge, gets the kill there. Mm -hmm. uh, what's more important about, you know, who, who got what, it's you have to remember that the map is more ambiguous here for Gumiho. He's not able to scout and check what's going on here. You don't want to be burning through scans this early on in the game. Uh, both sides will have their command centers on the low ground finish up. It looks like it's probably going to be um, <clears throat> the classic comps of a uh, tank bio. But let's hold out the possibility that we might see, um, you know, some more kind of weird mech stuff. Gumiho does mech a little bit uh, TVT. I mean, he mechs sometimes in all the matchups, but just curious to see if we're going to have anything like that this time around. I'm actually liking Gumiho's opening a little bit more here than what we're seeing from Cure. Going for the siege tanks very early out of that factory. Cure, I'm pretty sure, doesn't even have a tech lab on that factory just yet, and he's trying to hold the top of that ramp in case Gumiho moves across the map on the ground with his units, but in fact, in fact, Cure is just going to be wildly out of position for the Cyclone, both at the... Okay, Gumiho does pull back. But this one in the main base, there is nothing here to defend for Cure. His units are basically in the middle of the map. He's going to have to use this Cyclone and the Medivac and pull some SCVs. But the Siege Tank immediately focuses it down. Marines are now going to drop on top of the Siege Tank. And although Cure will be able to clean this up, six SCVs already going down. Now, my question is, how much damage is Cure going to be able to get done on the other side of the map? Because the Cyclone now hitting the natural expansion means even more damage is going to come in. Oh. And this Siege Tank... Really shelling those Cyclones. Kira is getting a beating here. Yeah, he was unable to really uh, get that tank on the high ground. That was super clutch. And now he's going to lose this in his uh, infantry units while he retreats. The command center's been lifted. Kira's already in wow. dire straits. He's really hurting right now. In fact, the counterattack from Gumiho is starting to sweep across the map and clear out the other remaining units that Kira has. This game could fall flat on its face here for Kira if he's not able to stabilize in the next few minutes. Yeah, Gumiho, once he stims this, I gotta keep saying it, stims the medevac on top of these yeah. marines, is able to get two of them. And every critical 
Every unit is critical here for Cure in terms of defense. He has bled out so much early. Gumiho up 10 army supply at this stage in the game when most of that army supply is in siege tanks is massive. There's only one Raven on the field here for Cure. I don't believe there is interference matrix research just yet. And Gumiho once again sieging up in the main base. Big shot on those Marines. And this tank is gonna fall here. With the Cyclone and the other tank already here, it's gonna be a lot to hack and saw your way through. Oh, he's he a tank? Gonna, yeah, he's got another ground. one on their low ground. Um, he's gonna try to clean this up as well, but he's gotta be careful. Reinforcements continue to come. And with no tank actually available right now, this could be a big problem. I think Gumio could really start to spiral this damage out of control. You can also get the kill on the tank right as it spawns. Yeah, it said Gumio just gonna go for the add-on, minimize the production out of the barracks, and Cure, by the way, right now is throwing down a third command center this in his is... main base. So that's that's some kind of bravery for him. We'll see yeah. if he can hold on. Oh my god, really good job with the auto turret. So smart. Uh, the spread of SCVs and Marines will eventually clean this up. But the damage continues to come out. This SCV is very low on HP. Gumiho once again boosting his medevacs into the main base. It's now, the spot in the third command center. Th there may be a point of diminishing returns. Like eventually when you have one tank like siege it up like this, it's like, well, this can't. This can't go on forever, right? Eventually, there is a thing called overextending. I think we might be past that point now. When one Marine and one tank are in a medevac, and you're ahead, you could, you could turn around. Yeah, I think Gumiho just a little bit over eager there, but yeah. You know, still, he's forcing energy out of Cure's Ravens, which is very good considering Cure is now getting interference matrix set up. The Infrastructure for Cure, kind of dismal back at home. He's only just now adding on barracks number two and three. And let's not forget that Gumiho, his third command center, it's already done. It's already on the low ground. He's adding on his fourth and fifth barracks. There are double reactors almost done on his second and third rack. So even though there was a little bit of an overextension there for Gumiho, I don't mind it too much considering the setup he is going for right now back at home because his economy is going to get online so much faster than Cure's. And I feel like in a couple of minutes, if Gumiho moves across the map and tries to get something done, it's going to be hard for Cure, even with Interference Matrix, to really stem the tide. Gumiho's position is so healthy. Although in some ways, I'm, I'm kind of intimidated by how good Cure is at defending all that. Like True. throwing the third command center down while you're getting harassed like that, where it's like, well, I gotta not only hold this, I have to catch up in bases. I gotta start landing mules and getting SCVs out here and just holding holding off with even less than I could have if I invested all that money into just more infrastructure immediately. Yeah, but truly everything is going Gumiho's way. Yeah, He's well, up. I think this game's probably gonna end with a Gumiho win unless Kira does something insane. As far as upgrades go, Gumiho started his 1-1 far far earlier than Cure did. I believe Cure's upgrades maybe only about a quarter of the way to complete, as you see. Infantry weapons and infantry armor level one about to complete here for Gumiho. So the window of attack that he's going to have to utilize these upgrades is massive. And I think Gumiho knows it. He's trying to line up the attack right in time with that. And he's also getting double Viking production right out of the gate. So he wants to slow push this position here for Cure and do not allow him to take a third base. And even with Interferix Matrix here on the side of the Red Terran, I, I am not sure he's going to be able to stop this push. I mean, just look at the RV supplies right now. 74 for Gumiho to 55 for Cure. And the Vikings just dominating the skies. Yeah, and you know, this really forces Cure to do something. If he doesn't, that command center is going to explode. Uh, he's being forced to use a lot of his own resources to repair it. The gases can't be mined from uh, without the risk of SCVs getting shelled. And I mean, this game goes one of two ways. Either Gumi wins it right now, or Cure is able to, to stop this push, this siege setup over here and start to try to get his third base landed. Oh my God, it's so low on HP too. Oh, I think it might be going down. I don't, He's gonna have to lift. Oh no, but Vikings are in the air too. <laughs> All right, so Kira going for a really big play, has three full medevacs of Marines. They're actually catching a lot of the reinforcements of Gumiho, but this defensive position set up by the natural expansion will be enough to thwart this attack. The Vikings actually still going after this command center, might be able to take it down. It's on 80 HP, SCV is getting pulled at Gumiho's third base. 
I think Kira is running out of steam on Gumiho's side of the map. Some SMEs do fall, but keep in mind that upgrade advantage here for Gumiho. It lasted a long time. No! 25 oh! HP. That command center no! is dead, man. It is not going to get repaired, is no, it? It's on like 1 HP. 1 he's HP. Got it. Got it. No way. It was literally, I think, 1 HP. Oh, this is like a bad movie. <laughs> it's like a bad movie, man. <laughs> I thought there was no chance the SMEs were going to repair Now just has to win. Well, he's going for the same idea. He's dropping a ton of Marines outside of his base and wants to kind of go into this almost pseudo base trade. Now, there's no, no Medivax here for Gumiho's army on the ground. As Kira's going to try and navigate across the map again. And now do you go for a flank on the position outside of your natural? Or do you try to continue to hammer Gumiho back at home? I feel like there might not even be a winning answer here for Kira, even if he plays perfectly from this position. What really can be done? He's basically on a one base economy. He cannot land that command center. He's gonna have to pull the SCVs, come in from the flank side and try and get out of this position, but Gumi Ho right now at 170 supply is yeah, just going to rinse it. it. There is no way that you can recover from this position. Just barely. Uh, Going to drive back that one tank, but I mean, you have to land the command center. The siege tank was actually in the way, by the way, where the yeah. command center could land. So it looks like we should be going uh, one to one here. Yeah, I think we're going to have the, the, the final execution coming up here from Gumi. We have a lot of uh, objects on the mini map moving up, and this should just be enough to overpower. I, I think the, the, the kids on the internet, they call this coping. <laughs> what Kira yeah. is doing right Some now. Mad cope. Gumiho on 100 plus more supply, about to finish three, three infantry weapons and armor. I mean, Kira, he, he's one map away from going to the semifinals, so I do not fault him on staying in this game at all, but he's gonna give it, you know, everything he's got. Yeah, I mean, there is a mental side of this too. Gumiho knows that he's in this dominating position, and if Kira can kind of frustrate him in terms of making this kill feel a little bit painful, maybe a little bit embarrassing, maybe Gumiho's gonna be in his head a bit like, the fans are watching this. They're expecting me to be able to close this out. Why haven't I been able to do it? There are some mind games like that that yeah, factor I mean, in a best of three. These players who just won't leave the game and put up a crazy fight no matter what. Um, well, that was cure this game. Gumiho takes game two. We're tied up one to one, leaving us with only one Terran versus Terran left over, uh, where we see who actually gets out of this group and who goes down to the uh, final match. I'm really impressed with both players so far in this yeah. series. This is a high-level TBT. Gumiho's aggression early on, I love the way that he navigated his build. He went for one Cyclone and then just pumped out Siege Tanks out of that factory nonstop, as early as he possibly could. And then just the relentless aggression, hamstring cure so hard in the early game that by the time the pressure was finally off, Gumiho was going up to five barracks. He was on three command centers mining fully. Just really a dynamic range of openings coming out of Gumiho and Cure. We'll see what's going to happen here in game three. I feel like there is no build that is off the table at this point. I mean, I, I get ready for anything here. Neither of these guys want to go down to the losers match either. You want to get out of this phase and into the round of four. Um, it does seem like if you're able to get enough tanks out, the Cyclone does become obsolete. It's like Cyclone versus Cyclone's arm ra arms race until enough of those tanks are there and then the whole game switches to the next phase of TBT. We're ready to go into the next game, the final game with these two. Give me over secure, let's do this. have here <laughs> oh wow is <laughs> it Makarax yeah it's a Makarax for for Gumiho for a second I thought Cure was building his also at the third base it's like the Spider-Man <laughs> yeah. like they're just pointing they're at each both other Macaraxing. <laughs> but we are gonna have a proxy second barracks here for Cure this is uh this is cool this is an arrangement of buildings that Almost looks like a Picasso painting on the map. It's like I mean, this is. <laughs> now I wonder: is there is it possible? I might be, you know, maybe 
putting myself out on the line here in a way that I don't need to. <laughs> but is it possible he wants to try to get Marauders out really fast with the second racks and try? Because oh, you know, we, we've had so many uh, moments where there's like Cyclones coming out. And, you know, the Cyclone is king when you have enough of them. Like I was saying right before we started, I had more to, to go, and I'm like, oh, we're actually going to zoom in on the players' faces and get into this. But I think it's more uh, likely to be two racks Reaper, but. I mean, with the way these builds have gone in the first two games, really, it feels like anything is possible. Yeah, and it, ma it makes me wonder. I guess two Rex Reaper is a more, you know, obvious, apparent where, uh, way to approach this. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how uh, two Rex Reaper is going to look when uh, the barracks is hidden on the low ground. I think it might just be a killing move. Yeah. Or if not killing, it, it could be something that backfires pretty hard for Gumiho going for this proxy barracks. and. Oh, if this scout comes through for Gumiho, okay, this is huge. If yeah. he did not know, this could be a disaster. But now Gumiho, he can ready himself. Yeah. So this is this is this completely changes everything. I was gonna yeah. say, if you could just get Reapers outside their barracks, they're gonna have to lift the barracks up, and by then there's, there's gonna be so many Reapers out, it might just snowball the game. But I think this is manageable. It should be. Kira still hasn't identified there is a barracks on the low ground, but he doesn't see one here in the main base, so he's not sure exactly what is up. And actually, here we go. Oh, that Reaper coming out of the rally, almost able to intercept this one. Kira now caught in the natural oh. expansion. There's no way to go. Okay, so hold up. That Makarat suddenly turned from an Achilles heel into an advantage as both the Reapers for Kira. He got so thrown off from yeah. the rally that he lost his whole advantage. Yeah, yeah, well he gets in there and it's like, okay, wh where can I intercept the next Reaper? What, you know, what's my position? And then suddenly a Reaper comes in from behind. Oh, and Kira, he's, he's trying to do the cheeky thing where he blocks the command center under the low ground. Too but Gumiho's late. already throwing it down. Man, I was really afraid for Gumiho. If Kira identified where the, the, the barracks was outside of the base, he could just easily intercept the reinforcements. It'd be so hard for okay, Kira so to defend, but. Hold the phone, state. What? We have a starport as well as a fusion core being made. Okay, what I, I is did going not. On? I did not have this on my bingo card tonight for GSL. Maybe in TVZ, but Gumiho, he loves his battle cruisers. This is a crazy game. What a best of three we are getting treated to. Now, Gumiho did overextend a little bit, pushing across the map with his Reapers and bled out a bit. And that makes me concerned for him securing this position, but with a second Cyclone about to pop out of that factory, I think he should be fine. Getting his expansion up and we'll see. So this is just such an interesting interaction here for the early game. Good control here from Gumiho. He is the Cyclone King. Both Cyclones have to back off at this point in time. Yeah, Gumiho. Now Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, um, we're just saying the battle cruiser has started. The command center is going to land. There really isn't anything to deal with the battle cruiser. I think it's possible Gumiho could just kill him here. A, a, a lot of your attention, I think, in this phase of the game, from Kira's perspective, is focused on getting your base set up and being safe versus the Cyclones. Um, right. But in order to do that, like I was saying earlier, you need to get enough tanks. So. The t but the tanks are obviously useless when a battle cruiser comes in. I think Gumiho might be moving across the map with these Cyclones and Hellions and trying to kill anything on the ground that can fight the battle cruiser. Try to trade them out with Marines, try to trade them out with Cyclones hmm. or get as much damage done as possible because we also have the Amato Cannon being researched. Yeah, this is one interaction that I do not know with the new Cyclone, but I'm assuming Yamato Cannon once shot them. <laughs> I'm yeah, pretty yeah. sure. I would I'm be surprised if it didn't. And so there's the potential if Gumiho decides to move cross map. I mean, he is pumping out Hellions. Hellions at this early stage of the game, they can tread Marines. Are we going to bank the BC? He's going for a second one. This I, is I crazy. I think he's going to move out. I think he's going to hit him. And Otherwise, there, there might just be enough stuff uh, inadvertently there to take this on. These units oh, might be for the old Yamato gun. Oh, no, he's not. No, he's not. He's just going to come right in. All right, well, Kira is probably a little bit confused by this. Already two Marines getting taken down as there isn't much here on the ground for Cure, The siege tanks are going to anchor the position a little bit here. Gumiho would love to be able to move in with the Hellions and the Cyclones to try and take out the anti-air. 
third base. Fort Cure and yeah, third base underway. Is he getting Yamato the Siege Tank? What is the priority here if you're a Gumiho? Oh! <laughs> it somehow lives. Now you. Uh oh. That's not exciting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, he can kind of just. He can do it a couple more times. Here right now, I mean, he's trying it, to buy time. It as does best not he appear can. to me that there's a whole lot that you can do to really deal with this. And when the tanks are on siege, I mean the Marines, you can see they're just not that tanky. Uh oh, battle cruiser number two. Yeah, another another siege tank is gonna get Yamato here in a moment. This is an oh insane my game. You know, it's funny. You can really see how much the units get stuck on each other. Right. When trying to run away from the battle cruiser. This is a third BC on the way, by the way. Oh, this is awesome. Oh, he's Behind going, it, he's going in mech. this. This is such a cool game. This is insane. I, I feel like Gumiho is getting very close to reaching a breaking point where he's going to get a ton of damage done on Kyrie. Kyrie is bled out. He has six Marines right now. He's bled out so many Marines. Now, Vikings are out. Another right. Yamato comes in. Siege tanks are getting picked off. And this is the problem right now for Kyrie is that every time he gets to disable, it's great. But when that finishes, usually a Yamato cannon's ready. My brother used to call it Yamato Gun. Yamato I called gun. it that in casting for a while. People were like, what are you talking about? Why do you call it Gun? I'm like, I guess you're right. <laughs> I guess that's some weird thing we were calling it. And then I got exposed to the whole world. And I don't know what I was, didn't know what it was truly called. So uh, the battle cruisers are going to loop around down to the bottom again. I kind of thought they were going to do a little bit more damage, by the way. I think they got a lot of damage done, actually. But I thought they were going to do even more. Um, I think because Cure had so many siege tanks on the ground, the the cell the, the cellians I almost said the cyclones and the hellions could oh. merge together and actually catch this run by coming in. The natural expansion SCVs are clubbing uh -oh. up. Oh, the siege tanks they get exposed. Yamato's on the two full HP ones, and then they power down the low HP one. Gumiho Gumiho's might be so going good. to the round of four with this build, and they're going to TP out. My goodness. This, this is, is crazy. A wild game, dude. This entire series has been awesome. I mean, what are the builds that we've seen from Gumiho? It was game one, Marauder opening against the Cyclones of Cure. Game two, Rapid Siege Tank, repeated drops with a Medivax. And now game three, Proxy Triple Battle Cruiser with Yamato Cannon into Mech. What a range of TBT. Gumiho is just really insane. Special. Now, this game is not over yet, but Gumiho is in such a commanding position. Kyrie's been on the back foot this entire time. He's pumping out pretty much nothing but Vikings and Ravens. Now, and now you have the mech on the ground. Yeah, and the thing is, the tank count has been so whittled down that now you can straight up tank push into other tanks. There's just not a lot you can do. The Vikings don't really help anymore. The battle cruisers have never left the game. It reminds me of like, you know, five years ago when we talked about Terran getting up the three battle cruisers versus Zerg, and it's like just a different way to play the game where as long as you don't lose them, you do get value. Oh, the Hellions and the Natural get another 11 SCVs. Gumiho has always had a different way of looking at Terran, and I feel like as crazy as Cure's Terran has been today, Gumiho really has stolen the show. Wow. All right, Disable comes in so that Yamato Cannon does get shut down. Blue Flame is done now for Gumiho in this TVT. Siege Tank count eight for Gumiho, two for Cure, as the Liberator is going to be the unit that tries to really fend off this assault. I mean, the Yamato Cannon, yeah, you're getting the Disables off, but the Cannon's not fully getting denied. Eventually, it's just going to try and come in again. And Kira, credit to him. He's sustained so much damage. We actually have triple Thor in production here for Gumiho. I think to deal with the Liberators, this is... Yeah, I, yeah, I think that, you know, maybe... Uh, wow! Just get rid of the Vikings at the distance. Now, Kira yeah, is still... Point. He's still alive, okay? It's basically been him almost killed off for, like, the entirety of this game. But a comeback could happen. An overextension could occur here from Gumiho. It's possible, but Gumiho right now taking his fourth base, adding in two more factories. Once the Thors work their way across the map, even taking a fifth base right now is Gumiho. His macro is 
obscene. And Kira, looking at the army that he has, it's an army that for now can survive, but it's an army that doesn't really have any counterattack potential. It's all about hoping Gumiho overextends and you're able to punish him for that, but... This is almost a box art army that we have coming up from Gumiho. Yeah, there's there's Thors and battle cruisers and siege tanks. We just see Tychus somewhere in here. <laughs> um, well, again, the tank count is way better right now for Gumiho. Yamato ca uh, cannon could pick off a couple more tanks, or in this case, I think they're just going to go for whatever they can get, so Vikings are also acceptable. There's no way I think that Cure is able to take a fourth base on no, this map. No, he's, he's totally boxed in. Oceanborn is always one of these maps that's kind of difficult for pretty much every race to safely secure a fourth base. That's just one of the features of this one is your three base setup, it's quite safe, but beyond that, it's hard to expand and take a fourth. And Gumiho with this mech can just kind of roam across the map, and there really isn't anything that can contest this. I mean, look at this army, it's insane. The Thors can deal with pretty much everything on the ground. It completely nullifies, I think, the Liberators. The Battle Cruiser is just constantly Yamato-ing everything, and Gumiho is feeling confident. He's going to actually siege up this position between the Natural and the Third. This is a big moment in the game. The Stable is going down on almost every single siege tank, but it doesn't matter. The Standing Army here for Gumiho is still so strong. Oh. And now the BCs, they pull oh, everything out of position. Oh my god, it was sick. They pull all the air out of position. They TP into the Natural. And now the Disables, they're mostly gone here at the ramp. Yeah, these Thors are going to am on the Vikings. But I'll tell you what, Cure. I'll tell you what, Cure is not dead. Yeah, he's hanging on. It was a little bit of an overextension there for Gumiho, I got to say. That was a very clever tactic, but... It was probably unnecessary. He yeah. probably could have had his two extra command centers finish. And... Um, you know, make this Kira's problem, because now Kira has a counterattack, and I'm actually starting to get a little bit worried here. All the tanks that were accumulated in this game uh, from Gumiho, well, they're they're gone. I mean, we've got one siege up here, but we know that's not going to last. SCVs are being pulled. Oh, my God. Is Kira going to do back. the reversal? Oh, my goodness. This is unbelievable. Gumiho trying to intercept reinforcements across the map with these battle cruisers. We're watching Thor's fighting landed Vikings. I know. We're fighting. It's, a, it's the <laughs> giant ground robots versus the flying small robots. <laughs> and Kira might have actually just done it. You called it exactly. He was waiting for Gumiho to go for an overextension. Gumiho possibly overextended a little bit too much there. The natural expansion of Kira. He got a lot of damage done, but he lost the critical tank count that was really Dude. the backbone of his army. Dude, but this is insane, man. I've never seen the TVT play out like this. Now the Thors are going to go down. The reversal has happened. I mean, the supply is just too low. Gumiho still mining on basically four bases. Is there a world where Gumiho could stabilize from this? I don't know how he's going to be able to clean up these siege tanks. Now, the battle cruisers are coming in. They're actually, wait, where are the Vikings? They were on the They're ground landed. fighting the Thors. How many are left? Oh, is there no more anti air? Well, there's Marines coming down. Hold up. There's only a handful, though. He has 15 Marines in total across the map. Dude, All this, the siege tanks are dying. This what game is, is actually too dramatic. It's too much. Is this the game of the year, Tasteless? This might be it. <laughs> this is wild. Yeah, he gets far enough, and it's like, uh-oh. This is insane. I feel like I'm a kid at a candy shop, and I'm like, I'm getting, like, the, the best candy. Like, the, the, the $20, like, <laughs> the $20, like, what do you call You're those? You're getting the those most big, expensive jelly yeah. beans in the candy shop. I, dude, this is such an insane game, and it looks like it might have balanced back out. we got to see if Kira can stop this next push that's going to come in here. So Kira right now, he's building Vikings five at a time because he still has no answer to the two battle cruisers that are standing. The Medivacs, they're very low on HP. Liberator is now coming across the map to try and get some damage done. Unfortunately, that one is going to siege up in range of a missile turret, and now it's Gumiho punishing Cure's overextension. As I feel like this game is so unique that even the players don't really exactly know what to do. And the standing army now for Cure, taking an inventory, is nine Vikings, one Liberator, six Marauders, and nine Marines. No siege tanks to be found. He's trying to build Vikings five at a time, and eventually those should be able to deal 
with the battle cruisers, but how do you deal with a stage tank count now up for Gumiho? Well, I, I think that's what's going to probably win the game for Gumiho now, unless this gets even crazier. Plus the Hellbats, too. I mean, there's almost more siege tanks than Marauders right now. Yeah, he actually evacuates the battle cruisers, probably to repair back at home. You know, uh, Cure got deep in there with his counterattack, but didn't take out any point of interest. And because I think there were so many bases that were mining. GG. Wow, what Gumiho an takes insane it. Dude, game. That was, that was by far the best game of the night. I don't know if we could top that. That might be the best game of GSL this season. That was so that was crazy. unique. I have never seen a TBT like that one. Kier almost in disbelief on stage, but Gumiho could be the first player to advance to the round of four in possibly the most dramatic fashion with one of the most creative and unique builds. That was so cool. It was really special, and you got to look forward to what he's going to do in future games here in this GSL as he goes to the final day, the round of four, and potentially the finals if he wins there. We're going to go to that interview now. <laughs> It was a tough series. How do you feel? Uh, firstly, thank you. I didn't know it was going to be a, this kind of day today. I could also feel that Kira is such a, a great opponent to play against. You have some very creative builds today. And you had some very... Uh, unique situations for a lot of that last game you were very ahead of him but then there was this crisis moment tell us about that <laughs> i think here is very good he's very resilient he knows how to defend especially versus mech terrence uh, as far as mech plays Terran in general haven't been doing as many mech plays, so I don't have that much practice with mech versus mech. I was pretty flustered when I had to deal with his mech style. I wasn't ready for a cyclone push earlier in that series either. Regardless though, you overcame. When you had your match against Solar, it seems like you really showed exactly how to use a, a mech approach versus Zerg. What is your evaluation of your own play in that game? It's really hard to max out a 200-200 supply. Much harder to do that than it is with Bionic or Bio-style. I don't know that mech always works or is always good, but sometimes when you get in certain situations, it can work well against any player. Anyways, I think Mech still has viable uh, viability. You made it to the semifinals two times in a row. What are your expectations going into this uh, semifinals now? I made it uh, again along with the last season. Uh, hopefully, I'm not going to see Dark a second time around. Oh. Even after the patch, Zerg seems to have an upper hand. But as long as I can perform well in my TVZs, which, by the way, is my weakest matchup, uh, I think I could still win. I think I still got a shot. There are so many fans, especially Terran fans, who are huge, uh, huge fans of mech play. Any words to them? Well, I'm almost a little bit disappointed in my play today. I wanted to show really stable execution today, but it was uh, a lot more dramatic than I was hoping it to be. Anyways, I'm going to work hard to have even more improved play. Thank you for cheering for me. Cool. Wow. You see how I fly in like Superman? I'm like, <laughs> and I'm back. Uh, well, I mean, this was a crazy um, TVT that we had here. That was some of the best TVT we've had. That's my favorite and We've had some very TVT. good TVTs yeah. in the last couple seasons, uh, last year as well. But, I mean, my God, how can you not be excited about a game like that? Triple Battle Cruiser, we've seen it before, not in TVT, 
Uh, we saw some very unique plays. I do think Gumiho got a little bit ahead of himself. It's like he was trying to end the game for so long. Eventually, mm -hmm. you need to realize, oh, I don't have to do anything. Yeah, just contain I've, on three bases, maybe. Yeah, I've got five bases. From there, you know, it's actually the opponent's problem. You don't yeah. have to just keep trying to kill them. Don't do what they call uh, the win more move. It made a pretty crazy situation, though, and I yeah. think it made the game more unique and well, fun. But. I'll take the drama. <laughs> Short break. We come back to CVZ for the losers match. Do not go away. We will see you soon. Tokatsun Good 
답답함을 빼면 더 청량해질 거야. 제로처럼. 우리 없어도 되는 건 빼고 살자. 칠성사이다 제로. 청량한 이 순간 칠성사이다로부터 칠성사이다 우주급 텐션 최고의 토킹 핫식스 토킹 귀엽고 잘생겼어요. 아이돌 창이라서 우와 행복이 느껴지고 있어요. 단순한 머리는 약할 것 같다. 똑 부러지는 모습을 본 적이 없어가지고 뭐 요리도 엄청 잘하고 동생이니까 뭐 부려먹기도 쉽고 다 시키고 저는 편안하게 좀 하고 싶습니다. 프리카 TV, 프리카 스튜디오, 라이브 2023 GSL 시즌 3 Welcome back, everybody. Gumiho survives. Now we go to who will be eliminated. This is DRG versus Solar in another mirror matchup, this time ZVZ. And um, I think Solar is favored here, but DRG is very good in ZVZ. You, you have to be good in ZVZ if you've uh, historically been a strong player in Korea. Yeah, when I think of Lynx and Bane Lynx, historically in StarCraft 2, I think of DRG. Yeah. I just I, I identify them so much with this play, especially back in the day when Ling Bay Muta was so popular, and he was one of the best ZBT players in the world as a result of it. But Solar lately has kind of been on another world in terms of ZBZ. Since Gamers 8, his win rate is, I think, above 90% in series against Zerg yeah. opponents. Something obscene like that, including, unless more games between him and Serral have been played, including a three series winning streak against Serral, who is, you know, easily, easily one of the best players in the world, arguably the best player in the world. So DRG has his work cutting out for cut out for him, but you know, his control is excellent. He has some killer instinct. He's very experienced on this stage, and I think uh, we are due for a action-packed ZBZ match. Yeah, let's get into this one. DRG versus Solar in a best of three to see who will go on to face off against Cure in the final match here of Group A in the round of eight. Club NV, DRG. Pool already. Ooh. One side, solar. Ooh. I was getting my notebook ready. I know. <laughs> didn't see that. Yeah. Is that a 12 pool, a 13 pool? It's an early one. Yeah, it is an early one, and it's going to be coming uh, from. Sorry, who's. We need to get the player names on here. Oh, yeah, think... where are the player names? All right, there they go. All right, it's coming from solar. Okay. <laughs> I was oh confused, my God. too. I feel like that was later than usual. I'm like, this feels like a bad dream. Then I realize I'm casting naked. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I can't tell which player's which. All my insecurities are coming out. All so, right. So uh, we had a drone that went all the way around. And it's going to come down here through the third. I think it goes out. It's going to go inside a vision range of the... Mm. Um, the Overlord. Yeah, unlucky for Sora to get scattered like that. I think he yeah. really wanted to build a spine crawler with this guy. Yeah. Now, so the the drone um, doesn't know the Overlord spotted it. By the way, the drone vision is not as big as the Overlord vision. So the thing is, when you see the drone come like that, you probably already know what this is. So mm -hmm. um, we'll have to see if DRG can handle this. Yeah, it's fine. But is... this isn't the craziest rush. Like if you played a lot of ZVZ, you'd know this. Um, that being said, the pool's not done. The lings go right through the little speed booster. Drones are going to be pulled. 
which will probably force this thing to cancel, but at the same time, these Lings are going to come in here and be doing a lot of damage. We have the Lings instead going for the um, the hatchery over here. He can make a uh, spine crawler down in the natural if he wants. He can also use the drone to try to help oh. fight. A little bit of a micro there from DRG for a moment. Took a lot of damage here on these drones. He's trying to stack them up using mineral walking so they can all yeah. attack at once and minimize the surface area, but they're already quite bruised. The Lings are going to come down. They're not quite close to the drones just yet. I think Solar can still overpower him here. It no, does. actually, you know what? Oh, yeah, it's pretty close. It's, but it's close enough that I think he can't even try to attack in one more time. Yeah, and I think Solar's pretty far behind from this position now. That was not the damage he was hoping to get. Those four lanes actually able to catch another one of the ERGs. So ideally, it should be able to protect the queen, especially with the second queen coming out. Well, I mean, where are we at now? It looks like less workers for solar. Um, DRG, you know, <laughs> I guess he has his drones there early for the transfer by defending mm -hmm. the natural. Um, so it's going to be an uphill fight for solar. Um, yeah, it's he, he does certainly get will. Two, two more out, but this expanse has just now been uh, completed. And I think actually things will probably level off here. I think it could go either way. Luckily, you know, DRG keeps his hatchery alive for a little bit longer. Uh, and I don't think there's any way for him to shut that down. We've got the Evo Chamber coming down here. It looks like there's a possibility that a wall will be set up. Do we have a layer making yet? I think it's circling speed probably going to be the choice from DRG. But Solar with this really... Oh, it is the lair. Man, you have the keen insight today. You're just making all these calls. Without the production tab, that's impressive. <laughs> you know, it's funny. But I was actually thinking it was going to be layer for uh, for Solar, to be honest. Oh, I was really? Asking about it. Well, I saw the Evo Chamber come down as part of the wall. And sometimes we'll see that where it's like, look at me, I'm going to try to do this tech, when in mm. fact, you know, you're just going to layer up behind it, especially with the double gases. But I guess this is all for looks. So yeah. when you look at Solar's base, he's got two extra gases uh, at the at the expansion, but he's not really using them or he's only partially using them. He's just satur saturating them now and yeah. no gas in the main base. The thing is, if you go for this early pool, you really can't afford to also take gas because yeah. that's another drone that's turning into an extractor. And it's... I'm, I'm going to correct myself again. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be also gas is taken in the main. So it, it's a very misleading thing from the perspective uh, of DRG. Right. Because you might be thinking that's a third or even a fourth gas. Now, the Ling Scout Ooh. is going to be really big here for DRG because now he knows exactly what's coming. Yeah, and he's going to scout the lair as well coming in the main base here. And I think at this stage in the game, those Ling's, they aren't going to be able to get too much done. So for DRG, knowing that you're ahead economically, with your defense of that 12 or 13 pool, whichever pool timing it was opening. Sacrificing those links to get a confirmation on the scout is just excellent to have that information because now he can make the right judgment calls. He knows he can play safe. He knows that all ends aren't exactly a threat this early. As both players get roach speed. DRG, of course, with the faster layer tech, will have roach speed done. Does that overlord get away more quickly from the queen? I guess we're not going to follow it, but yeah, I think. Oh, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's okay. Yeah, they're, they're all speed boosted up. I think Solar might wait for the lair to finish and then make like an overseer <laughs> try and fly yeah, it in. Yeah, actually, that might be it. I wonder. Oh, no, he brought the. I see on the minimap, he brought the overlord back from the other tower to be able to snipe it down. So it's Solar just hard committing to killing that, that overlord. Kind of a funny interaction in the middle of the map. Yeah, we've got the overseer of DRG uh, drifting through the natural expansion, trying to get any intel that they can get. We've got two Evo Chambers over at the Natural, but only one has been upgrading. Both sides getting missile attack. DRG's missile attack upgrade will finish uh, more quickly. And yeah, DRG just ahead. A little bit in terms of tempo when it comes to upgrades, when it comes to macros, that third base already complete, and Roach is now coming across the map. Keep in mind, DRG does have Roach speed. Solar, his should be on the way. Yeah, it's about halfway done, but plus one. Range weapons, not yet here, and DRG actually has a pretty good number of roaches. It's gonna come yeah. all the way up the ramp. And, I mean, this is a lot of confidence. There are queens in the back here for Solar. Reinforcements do merge up. Um, but it seems almost like Solar might just have enough with as far as reinforcements go. It didn't seem like that was ever gonna snowball in his favor. Yeah, Solar with a really smart drone cut at 43, just reading that there was aggression potential coming out from DRG, and so DRG went for that timing. Kind of skill check play did not manifest in anything, and instead is going to go back home. And both players are going to drum back up, so not too much changed 
there in terms of the general structure of this game, but the main concerning thing for me is DRG, now he has plus one Carapace underway, he's getting plus two range attack. I think if he goes for another timing attack when plus two attack and plus one armor is done before Solar's plus two attack completes, that can be absolutely devastating in a Roach versus Roach battle. Yeah, and so for now he's gonna have to bide his time. There are more Roaches out here for DRG, um, but probably not enough to the point where he could force anything across the map. Oh, um, this is actually a really smart play coming in from DRG. DRG transferred a large number of drones from the natural expansion to feign as if he's oversaturating the third oh, base, as if he's going catch, for a higher Dave. drone yeah. count. Instead, he only did one more round of drones. He went up from, I think, 41 to 49. Meanwhile, Solar is macroing up to 64. He thinks that this is, you know, edging towards, leading towards a macro game, but instead, DRG is getting ready to basically do an all-in plus two, plus one timing attack with these roaches. Yeah, he might end up actually falling right into this trap if he scouts this and decides um, yeah. to, to go for it. Missile attack plus two is done. And this is a scary moment for Solar. Not only is Solar droning up, but he's also researching upgrades like Burrow, like Tunneling Claws that are not necessarily going to allow him to help in this attack. They would be great use in a macro game, but with DRG just zeroing in on the aggression, you got to think that Solar's going to be hard-pressed to defend this one. Now, he is trying to macro back up, but DRG pushing this advantage right now. Plus one, armor is done. Arc really good here for DRG. Nice splits oh. on the Biles as well as he continues to press forward. More Roaches rallying across the map. Yeah, and uh, he's going to keep trying to push in. There's a couple Queens coming down here to help defend, but the upgrade advantage is real. And it looks like we should have some more reinforcements coming up here. A big wave at the bottom part of the map. It looks like it's actually attacking through. Maybe a counterattack? Yeah. Mm. And so right now we have DRG winning on multiple fronts. GG. DRG takes game number one. Beautifully done. Yeah, really well played there by DRG. Just got that slight lead from the openings and did not relent with any of that momentum. Did not give Solar a break. I love the big brain move of transferring basically all of the all of the I almost said probes and then I almost said SCVs, all of the drones from the natural expansion to that third base and feigning as if he is droning up heavily because Solar, I'm not sure if he spotted that with an Overlord or with a Scouting Ling over the Roach, but it seemed like he was expecting that one to go way more macro. He was sending Roaches cross map to timeout with Tunneling Claws, with Burrows to try and get some harassment done, but DRG just zeroed in on the all-in timing and it worked to perfection. Very impressive stuff from DRG. Really in control of that rush. Uh, and I love what you caught back there, State. Excellent work when he, he transferred an amount of drones over to the third base to make it look like he's at full saturation everywhere, when in fact he was at half saturation at his second. Just in case he could bait Solar into attacking him. But he, didn't even, he did not even need to do it. Said he just won with that timing. Guys, game two's ready. Let's go. Club NV, DRG. It rhymes. Oh, it does. It does. He just can't change team now. <laughs> no, it's his it. lifetime contract. He's got to get that tattooed on his Onside, face. Solar. So, we don't have a quick pool just yet. Um, not that we normally have a quick pool, but I, I, I want to know what it looks like when these two duke it out under. You know, a typical ZVZ circumstances where it's like, you know, you're both expanding. Yeah, I'm a little bit surprised that Solar went for the early pool in their match. I'm not sure if it's something that's been working for him in practice, or maybe he had some kind of insight into what DRG would be doing, but I feel like as soon as John Grey Goose spotted that drone with the Overlord, he knew exactly what was coming. And, you know, the micro wasn't completely perfect, but it was certainly good enough for him to retain his advantage. I mean, the hatchery took half HP, and at the end of the day, he was just a tempo ahead on economy pretty much the entire game. Yeah, it was very cool to see. <laughs> to Canada, so we came here. Wait, are they are they hiding from Artosis in Canada right now? That's, That's right. Once they means. showed up on Prince Edward Island, yeah, they had to flee. <laughs> They're like, we got to get out of here. They had to change the StarCraft balance in the universe, all right? For every StarCraft person that leaves Korea, another one must come in. <laughs> 
So uh, um, the, the build orders are mirrored. Even the pool placements are mirrored. Almost even the gas timing is mirrored. Look at this, four, yeah. four or eight gas ahead for solar. It's like, whoa, who's who? I mean, it's crazy. Uh, oh, interesting spawning pool placement, actually. Yeah, over by On the ramp. Of them? Huh. We'll see if they want to try to make more of a wall with that position, maybe. Yeah, wait, go back to solar spawning pool. Look, they had an antenna on it. Yeah, it does. I'm it not it looks like it's with plugged it. into the ground because of that doodad. <laughs> yeah, I think it's that, part of the that skin. That one's got, yeah, direct. It's got an Ethernet cord into yeah, the Yeah, look at it. He's, got Ethernet, he's, <laughs> he's listening it's to good. the GSL. Yeah. <laughs> this, down, this download speed is better at that base. Is that DRG's base? <laughs> Meanwhile, Solar's playing on Wi-Fi with his spawning pool. Yeah. All right, both players just kind of continuing with the trend of relatively relatively mirrored builds. Solar taking his hatchery just a little bit earlier than DRG's, but oh, the, the difference in terms of builds right now is so minimal. I think it's it's one one more drone, I believe, for Solar and two more lings for DRG. So they're both going for third bases. They're both going for Bane Ling's nests. Keep in mind that that can mean they're still both actually doing Ling Bane defense. Yeah, it is possible. I feel like it doesn't happen very much when we cast, but a lot of times it's one guy is choosing to try to be an honorable Zerg and macro up, and the other one's trying to kill him in the process. But we may end up with a very passive game on both sides. Yeah, we'll see how this one develops. Watching the production uh -oh. tab, both players. DRG yeah, making more lings. There are some more lings there for DRG. More drones coming here from Solar. And DRG builds another drone himself. So I think they're both just kind of making the amount of lings that they feel will keep them safe. And they both are going to get a Roach Warren. It's one of the most mirrored CVZs I've seen. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things when you cast CVZ is sometimes it is that. we got to wait for the uh, the fork and the build orders here mm -hmm. uh, off, off the production tab. And I think it is going to be basically macro play. They're both getting the same number of drones. And so the game's just going to continue to develop. I almost feel like I'm watching a PvP and I'm, I'm trying to cast a section of the game before the cybernetic score is done, where oh, everything's yeah, the that, same. That's except... actually a good way to think about it, where it's like, well, we have to wait for one of them to do what the other guy's not doing. Uh huh. But in this case, they just keep doing the same thing. Yeah, now we've got six roaches making. Are we going to have, okay, we oh, have 18 links over here for Solar. That is a nice catch for and Solar. He gets the queen and he also has the bane links to protect, so he didn't make too many links or bane links, but he was able to find value. And I think that's three or maybe even four drones in total getting taken out early on from this harassment. And that queen going down is pretty significant, I have to say. Also gets the scout on the roaches popping out on DRG's side of the map. Both players are now macroing up with Roaches. DRG, I believe, did start Roach production a little bit sooner, but Solar a bit ahead now. That was a really nice catch there on the third base. DRG was unprepared to defend it. Now we got to see what Solar can do here with this next wave, because the drones are going to be remade, but this will all uh, set up pretty nicely here for Solar to do another hit. He might want to try to send a couple links into the main or go into an unusual spot. Um, and behind that, uh, as, as the position is, is fractured here for DRG, maybe Solar hits once again um, and with his roaches. A counterattack oh. comes in, and it's actually not plugged up. Oh, it barely gets, barely gets plugged oh, okay. up there right at the last moment. So actually, it's a Weirdly, bad thing for it's DRG. Almost better. Yeah, it's almost yeah. better for DRG now because he, he let in like almost the perfect amount, and then it got uh, sealed off. Yeah, so the, those links got cleaned up, and... There was basically no damage on Solar's side. Meanwhile, DRG once again had to fend off a counterattack of a handful of Lings. Two drones in total go down. So we're going to wait. Solar once again um, just going to come forward with these uh, these roaches right now. DRG comes up. Oh, and there's a lot of Lings getting into the natural expansion here of DRG. So Solar just pressing forward here at the third base. Ravager's morphing in, microing the low HP roaches. And the Ling's also getting surrounds on both queens in the main base. And I feel like we just reached the tipping point yeah, that, of this game, Tasteless. Uh, I think so. I think we're going to tie this up 1-1. One one. Uh, GG Solar. Beautifully done. We're going to get game three right away. But honestly, it was like just a really good tactical setup there. Um, yeah. From Solar, he, he got a couple drones. He got the queen which you wouldn't think is very much, except that they were both almost dead even. And actually, for a little bit before the attack, Solar actually droned up more. Um, 
But yeah, then DRG, even when he did that counter attack, it was like just enough to not fully let the lings in, let a couple in. I doubt it was intentional. I think he wanted to plug that up no matter what. Of course. But um, yeah, I mean, that counter attack just came through and punished. And so it's all going to come down to this final game on site Delta. The loser is out. The winner plays Cure, who, by the way, is looking terrifying in the matchup TVZ. Yeah, it's going to be a tough road for either of these players to get out of Group A and into the round of four. First step is going to be winning. Map number three here on site Delta. Will Solar continue his ZBZ winning streak? Or will, D will DRG fight back to fight here? I don't know why I'm so tongue tied on these names. They're not that hard. All right, let's go into game <laughs> number three. Club NV, DRG. Onside, Solar. Just go to back to that previous ZBZ. Again, think of how long that game was mirrored third base timings, almost even the Roach Warren timings, the speed timings, the Bane Ling count, the Ling count. Down to the drones. It yeah. was basically even, but Solar was just able to find the tightest little angle at the third base of DRG to kill not only a queen, but three or four drones. And on top of that, his Lings, when they ran past the natural expansion there, all the way from Canada, go, go, Zerg. Zerg supports, you can't be wrong with a sign like that. I'd be happy with this one. Zerg wins no matter what. But now, uh, Solar just navigated that so beautifully. And also scouting the roaches coming out at a critical timing from DRG's natural expansion. Yeah. Just so well done. It feels like even in a situation where the builds are almost entirely mirrored, Solar is just able to find any advantage to open up the game and even though we were mirrored up to three bases, from that point, it basically just snowballed into a defeat in the span of two or three minutes. It was crazy how fast things fell apart there for DRG. Solar just really on another level in ZBZ over the past couple of months. And if he can keep performing at that level, he will be fighting Cure in the final match. But DRG also looking really good. I liked his play in game number one. It's a hard series to call. Yeah, I think either of these guys could easily take this one. I mean, DRG's was also just so impressive with how he held so perfectly and then set up so cleanly to to close it out. I was a little a little bit caught off guard with Solar even opening up with that building game one. I didn't think he had to do it, but I guess unpredictability is also a key feature of a good player, right? Um, this time around, two extra drones being made here uh, for Solar where we had four lings uh, about to hatch here for DRG. The third hatchery has been planted. Now we got to see, is there also going to be a third hatchery? There is. So it's going to be once more three hatch versus three hatch. We don't have the two hatch walnut, the entrance style that we've seen so often. Bit of an earlier bailing nest this time for DRG as he continues. Gas production. I'm wondering if this might be Ling Bane from him quite early, quite aggressively on the third base of Solar, but... No, more drones in production. So DRG just kind of playing a very safe defensive game with that bailing that's timing. I, I think so. I think he just wants to have one or two banes covering his drones so that the lings can't just run in there and wreak mm -hmm. havoc. We have a bit of a ling flood here yeah. from both players. <laughs> we have a lot of lings coming up here. Now we have a Roach Warren being built. And notably, no bailing nest here yep. for Solar. So Solar might just try to make a bunch of lings, throw them off into a bad position, and then have like a battering ram of roaches try to power through plowing down the position. And you know, when you get this many roaches, you don't really care about Banes. Yeah. They don't really do anything. I think Solar is probably going to use those roaches to defend the third base after feigning this big pressure here on the third of DRG as Banelings are more. So a lot of damage done to that hatchery, but nothing critical. DRG droning up. Actually, it's a pretty confident move from him, going with nine drones and Solar immediately pumping eight roaches. And oh actually, he's going to try and commit God. to the hatch. Oh, he gets it! This is crazy. That queen and also was so close to transfuse. Yeah. The Lings are still on the run here. 
I don't think he should try to fight the other Lings back. There's too many Lings with full HP versus ones that are very, very damaged. Better to send them back and regen them. Now, a, a, a Roach Warren is also being made over here for DRG, but already the Roaches are out here for Solar. And nine Roaches in total walking across the map. There are some droning. There is some droning going on behind this for Solar back in his base, but just a little bit. It's more Roaches and more Lings now coming across the map. And with only two Banelings here for DRG. Oh, man. Oh, he might just be getting outplayed in this scenario. Yeah. That third base, I don't know if it's going to get back up. And it now suddenly these Lings are zoned out by Roaches on both ramps. Well, Solar's just running circles around him. This hatchery can't finish. It's got to be canceled. And narrowly canceled it is. Oh, this is so painful for DRG. And he's going to make a hatchery here again. Uh, the roaches are a little bit separated. You, you really, you know, strength the numbers here. Oh, wow. man, that was nasty. Oh, man, Solar just with some crazy micro. Yeah, yeah. No and, one oh, he's going to get this around other roaches, too, on the low ground. Two or three of them are going down at least. Gets the third. And now DRG is basically holed up on two bases. He's going to try and retake this third. But Solar with a more powerful economy, a more powerful standing army here right in front of the base. This is looking really good for Solar. Now, DRG is still hanging on. His hatchery is going to finish in a little bit here. It's a little ways out. But things are developing more over on Solar's side of the map. I mean, 13 drones is so significant. Even the natural expansion right now for DRG is not fully saturated. And so... I mean, yes, part of this is a game of survival for DRG, but he needs to find an opportunity out of the pretty shattered position he's already in. I mean, that third hatch, you need to start mining uh, resources from that. You're going to have to try to drone up as much as you can. Still 42 workers to 53. Solar's been on 53 for a while now. Yeah, five more in production, too. Yeah. So There's no upgrade advantage here for DRG either because Solar's going to be able to match him the moment that finishes. And Roach Speed is going to be significantly faster for Solar as well. So this is looking really good for Solar right now. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a drone cut either here at 58 or maybe around 60 and just nothing but Roach production because in theory with the damage that DRG sustained at his third base, it should not be feasible for him to defend. Man, I mean, I'm just trying to imagine a world where DRG can recover. It's been a quiet lead here for Solar. And that's, you know, one thing that makes Solar such a good player is he gets his advantage and then he pulls out. Yeah, He kind of waits to harvest that lead mm -hmm. a little bit later on. Where, you know, kind of like what we saw in the last best of three, it was Gumiho, you know, overextending to the point where he almost threw the game, where, you know, Solar will, will dial it back and then set up a killing blow. And Solar right now with this economy, DRG has only just now joined him in terms of worker count, but that's because Solar has been in full army production for about the last minute and a half. Roach speed is almost done. DRG's Roach speed probably about 30 seconds away. Now these two Bailings coming into the third base, they will get six drones, yeah, the, and that's a nice catch, but the real issue right now is this army at the front door. Yeah, those six drones have already mined up enough resources to help uh, in a, create an army that's going to be this big, and I just do not know the DRG can hang on. Moroj is going to continue to merge in with the rest as the supply stays pretty consistently at about 150 here for Solar. GG, Solar defeats DRG. Man, that was a clinical ZBZ right there on that third base. Solar somehow with just pure Ling against Ling Bane able to get the kill on that third hatchery and then coming again with nine roaches to make it get canceled again. And then behind that just lines up the most beautiful timing. It feels like he can really see through the matrix in these mid-game ZBZs, just yeah, really unstoppable. Does. As for DRG, it was a great run, making it into the round of eight this season, but his story in GSL, at least for this year, will end here. Guys, we're gonna be right back. Coming up next, the final match of Group A in the round of eight, Cure versus Solar. We'll see you in a minute. Is when you're away, I'm cold right through my bones. I can tell which headlights yours. They follow me until I'm begging you to walk right through the door. How do you sleep at night? Tell me what to do.
Had me in your possession Had you swim inside my affection But with you I came second So I cut off the connection And now you're calling me Holding your heart there inside your hands You say I'm where you wanna be But you're out of chances to come back Crying over the love that you had Maybe nice try Maybe next time You'll hold on to what you have No, you don't get to show up TV I'd say and I'm all you want Maybe nice try Maybe next time You won't sleep on a good love Keep on talking but I'm같은 하루에서 답답함을 빼면 더 청량해질 거야. 제로처럼. 우리 없어도 되는 건 빼고 살자. 
실성 사이다 제로. 우주급 텐션 최고의 토켄 하시엑스 토켄. 청량한 이 순간 실성 사이다로부터 실성 사이다. 귀엽고 잘생겼어요. 아이돌 상이라서 뭐가 행복이 느껴지네요. 단순한 머리는 약할 것 같다. 또 부러지는 모습을 본 적이 없어가지고 뭐 요리도 엄청 잘하고 동생이니까 뭐 부려먹기도 쉽고 다 시키고 저는 편안하게 좀 하고 싶습니다. Today's matchup: Cure, DRG, Gumio, Solar. Round of eight. Move in. 아 f r i c a TV, f r i c a Studio, live. 2023 GSL Season 3. All right, this is it. This is the final best of three for the evening. And this one should be a banger. Cure versus Solar is coming up. Now, Cure looks so strong. And I, I don't want to take anything away from Solar. I think the last couple games we saw from him, you have to admit Solar looks strong. He's always looked strong, to be honest. But Cure, um, what he's been doing in this matchup, if he has any more ideas as strong as what he's already shown, I think he's a shoe in to win. It does feel that way. Yeah. You know, ever since Group A, when Maru got knocked out first in GSL Code S, which is just the most Crazy. insane plot twist you can imagine, the first thing that came into my mind is, all right, now it's Cure's time. And here he is, one series away from going to the round of four yet again this year. Cure has been rock solid, and not just in TVP, but his TBT looks better than ever, his TBZ looks better than ever. And if I'm Solar right now, I'm worried, man. Yeah. Sure, he's got a wide range of builds. He can showcase a lot of different styles. Cyclone's been used quite a bit here from Cure as well, but he's mm -hmm. also shown he can win games without even making a single one. And um, with a range like that in a patch this new, it's got to be a threat here to Solar. But who knows? Solar's got a many, many tricks up his sleeve as well. Let's see what happens as we start our best of three. On side, Solar. Okay, let's get into this game. Immediately we have the first barracks placed on the low ground. Well, I guess on this map it's not really the low ground, but it's lower than the main, uh, still up on high ground here. It's the middle ground. The middle ground. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to see, are we going to have a second barracks place down here as well? This is, you know, originally the Beyond build, but it seems like everybody's been using it. And yes, we will have that second barracks. Yeah, on Site Delta especially, it feels like a very good opening because yeah, the, the Queen's walking from the natural expansion into either of the thirds, either the, the one that goes vertical for Solar or the triangle third on this map. It's a lot of distance to cover. And if you open with, you know, say four Reapers, you can oftentimes, if not outright deny that third expansion, you can get a lot done against it in terms of HP, setting up for a push later on in the game. And I wouldn't be surprised if Cure decided to go that route. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to knock over this build. It's just so, so good, so strong on, on this map. And it lets you, you know, really, you can lean into it as much as you want, or you can like abandon it after the third Reaper and just expand. That's a really fun opening. I mean, Bion absolutely was right. Oh, he, he was spot it. on. Because I remember originally, me included, but some other players were kind of like, well, isn't this just like a Bion opener? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, oh, you get a little bit more Reapers out and get to harass. But it turns out the fact that you can mitigate progress at the third hatchery and maybe even deny it is huge. 
Yeah, and there's so many transitions out of it, too, that you can do. We've seen players just go for straight up macro games with a faster command center. We've play seen players work their way up the tech tree quite normally, as I believe Kira did earlier on against DRG. And we've also seen players, Yun especially, just throw down additional barracks behind it and go for some kind of all in play or heavily committed timing attack with Bio on the ground without Metavax. And Solar, he's trying to hide this drone up here at the top right, but Kira is oh. too smart for this. He didn't see. Oh, okay. it's barely. Oh, it even blocks the extractor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was that was super awesome. Hold positioning the Reaper there on the extractor means that it cannot go down. And yeah, it's gonna be a faster command center here for Cure. So, and by uh, the way, like this is becoming more and more of a problem with the more TVZs we're seeing here. And I don't want to say problem in like a bad way. Like, oh no, what are we gonna do? I mean, Zergs are gonna have to figure this out. Yeah, I think it might lead to either a change in the way that they're drafting maps or maybe there's a change in play style because these Reaper openings, especially out here in Korea, Korea just have some of the best Terran players in the world. They're oh. deadly. Yeah, they're absolutely hard to deal with, but Ling Speed about to finish now. Yeah, and like we've seen before, um, the, there's always a moment where it's time to get the Reapers back home. They've served their purpose. This is one of those moments in the game where you just look at the game clock. You go, okay, at this moment, that's when Zergling speed's done. And uh, send it back home. Yeah, but the damage is already done. As you said, he got that second drone quite early there. First drone going in for the third base as well was denied. And this third hatchery for Solar is much later than he would like for it to be. The creep spread has also been delayed because once you get enough Reapers, you can start to just grenade down the tumors as well. And it's hard for Zerg to deal with, so. Solid opening here for Cure behind it. That third command center now turning into an orbital command in the main base. We do have double cyclone production underway at the ramp of the natural expansion. Gearing up for a timing attack that looks really similar to what he went for against DRG. Now this one, yeah, with this, the cyclone pairings, this is gonna be interesting because this could add a little bit of extra momentum into the push. And I think it's going to hit at an earlier time than uh, I think most of us were expecting. When you see a third command center made early, you kind of don't imagine that there's any way to do any kind of pressure. But the Cyclones might change that. The Cyclones are making the math on a lot of the timings a lot fuzzier. Mm -hmm. yeah, being able to react with them out especially adds a lot of uh, a lot of problems into the equation here for Zerg. again. the critical mistake that Kier made, I believe, when he went for this push against DRG previously was he engaged before stim pack was done. And so once the Lynx came in with the surround, they were able to, able to get That's a right. ton of damage in. But this time, Kier, he waits. He bides his time, he moves a little bit more slowly, waits for his stim to finish. And now he's gonna start pressuring the third. Now, Solar's been making a ton of Lynx to deal with this. In a stage in the game where Zerg is usually a good number of workers ahead, it's actually only two drones advantaged over the 48 SCVs of Cure. And Cure is playing this quite safely as well. He's not really committing. He's just kind of sharking around the map, forcing more units to be produced by the Zerg player. And I love that for him because if he overcommits to the third base and these units get wiped out, it takes a lot of the power out of these follow-up pushes. But instead, for now, Cure is just kind of biding his time. He's getting upgrades. He's getting combat shields. Both engineering phase are now complete. So 1-1 one, one will soon be underway for the Terran. And Joining forces with Medivacs adds a lot of sustain to this army, and it seems like now Kira is just going to be focused on denying creep spread and delaying the fourth hatchery. Okay, a scan down here. And he's going to try to push this all the way through. Uh, the Lynx can't really get good surface area on that ramp, but I love the counterattack. That was there earlier to try to catch reinforcements, but when the reinforcements didn't come, uh, Solar made very good usage of them. Oh, he's going to pick up SCVs like that. Also delays SCV production there at the third base. So Solar fighting back a little bit in the macro way. Cure just continuously roaming around the map. It's very hard for Solar to come in and actually engage against this unless Cure overextends on creep. Partly because this army off creep is just so mobile. The Marines with Stim can micro quite well. As, okay, let's pull that thought actually. Yeah, as Cure yes. going for the fourth hatchery. Now he's pretty deep into the bottom part of the map here. Although, I gotta say, the keep away game is pretty good. Yeah, keep in mind, there are four Reapers alive with us, and those grenades really fuzz the equation here for Solar. Makes engaging very difficult. 
Failing speed only about halfway done. 1-1. One, one. Almost on. completed. So Solar's going to go for the surround now on everything. Link's getting a lot of surface area. The Marines will get lifted up as the Cyclones and Reapers get traded out. A favorable trade there for Solar, but now the reinforcing push is coming, and soon Cure's upgrades will equalize with the Zerg. Yeah, I thought the, the Cure was going to go back down through the bottom. When I saw him go up to the top, I thought, oh, well, then there's no way you're going to get out of there. Uh, is this is this enough with this push? I feel like Solar should actually be able to squash this. Yeah, Solar has a lot of army, and Bailing Speed's about to be done as well. Drone cut at 62 means that he has sacrificed a lot of economy to be able to hold on against a push like this one. One lone rate Ling in the third base there of Cure actually getting some SEV damage done. 1-1 one, one now completing for the Terran. As Cure is okay. trying to get something done, but Tasis, here comes the surround. Yeah, and some of these uh, siege tank shots pretty good, but certainly not enough to take on, um, you know, what was the, all those Lings and Banes earlier. But with what we see here now, this is going to be a forced pickup. And honestly, I do feel like this is getting better and better here for Solar. It was a good cleanup there for Solar, but I think for Cure it was relatively cost efficient. Yes, he did lose those two siege tanks, but most of the Marines emerged unscathed. A ton of Lings and Banelings also went down during that fight. And for Solar right now on 66 drones, it's going to be kind of hard for him to make something happen unless he goes for counterattacks like this one. This is really going to be a thorn in the side of Cure as six SCVs fall. But the standing army for Cure knocking at the door of Solar is so scary, even without a healthy tank count. Okay, Act Two. Siege tanks once again behind the uh, the Vespian gas geyser, giving a pretty good foothold um, on this base. And I think there's maybe no way to save this. Well, hold that thought. More banes are going to come down. The bottom army does a pretty decent job oh. and a pretty good pickup at the top. He can try to merge this back together here. The tank was not killed, so it got an extra volley off. Good bailing connections there on the top side, though. Kira was a little bit slow on the pickup with the Marines, so some of them unnecessarily did go down. Still ahead in supply is Kira. He's macroing up a big army back at home, so he's just going to take the best trade he can here, pick off some lings, and then go for the hot pickup. Head back home. Meanwhile, Solar is going up into Hive Tech, still on 65 drones. So. He hasn't been droning at all during any of these engagements. Meanwhile, Cure back at home is continuing to power up his economy on three bases. Now at 61 workers, 2-2 two -two upgrades are underway here for Terran. Liberator production has begun. And I, I'm worried for Solar because the drone count, it's been low for a long time. And I think if you want to work at a drone count as low as that one, you need better trades because Cure's army right now, it's starting to gain a lot of momentum, especially with plays like this. Okay, so the Banes are once again going to drive this out. Another, oh, oh! Big connections there. By the way, Solar's still on the five bases. Hold on. This might be the one where he gets taken out, though. I was going to say, if, it, if he doesn't at least get a hat trick kill, he's not really uh, reducing the income at all here. I mean, you're happy to trade out all day as Zerg if you're going to keep your hat trees and your drones alive. Two, two weapons now done here for Curious. He's going to push once again at the New fourth base for Solar over here on the right side. A couple of siege tanks, Liberators will also be sieging up shortly. There's so much Ling Bane and an Ultralist Cavern now underway here for Solar. Vipers in production as well. Solar's actually just going to sack this base. He doesn't think he can hold it. So okay. Cure, he goes for drones, he gets four of them. This is kind of crazy because like a little bit ago, it looked like Solar could hang. Now he's lost both of the hatches. So it's three base versus three base now. A big Ling counterattack. But without Banelings in that, you will oh. eventually clean that up. Oh, speaking of Banelings. Oh my goodness, there's some huge that connections. Was, that was crazy. But the counterattack did not get very much done on Cure's side of the map. In fact, the, the depot placement on the low ground is so smart. They're just kind of funneling in the Lings, not allowing them to get service area on the Marines. And Solar, he's going to need to get something done with Adrenal and with these Vipers because his economy right now, just sitting on three bases, it's dismal. He's barely keeping pace with the Terra, and even though those counterattacks got so much damage done, once Kira resaturates the third base and drops some mules, that mineral income will once again skyrocket for the Terra, and his Kira's almost maxed out. Yeah, and, and it, this is just one bad interaction for Solar away from GG. He is still on three bases. There are no SCVs mining, by the way. Yeah, there's no none binding to the third. I didn't even realize that until now. I'm surprised we don't have anything saturated there. I guess Kira just wants to completely focus on fighting here. He does not want to rally across the map now. One siege tank will get abducted. A second one will as well. But the Marine count standing very strong. Had some nice trades 
with the links. And look at this defensive setup right off Creep Keeper Cure. He can just kite back into this at any moment. He's going to try to come through a little bit further. The spread is insane. It's insane. And this base is in such a difficult position. We're going to have another uh, 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 stim in, I, I'm sure, as more tanks get siege up. There's a counterattack, but I don't think he's going to fight anything. I think the SMB is being not at that third base is deliberate. He's just like, oh, I don't. Why, why would I even let you try to punish me with a counterattack? Yeah, we do now have some Ultralis entering the field. About three of them here ready to pop. One doing good work, but the Marines getting a lot of damage done again on the Lings and Bane Lings. The Ultra with Chitness Plating really the only thing standing against the massive firepower of these Marines. But with seven Liberators in the fold, you can just kite back to them. They do so much damage to the armor of these Ultras. Oh, hold that thought though. Solar, the Medivac's out of position. He's actually getting a good surround on the Marines. Solar might be holding on here. I mean, this is so close. Army supplies right now, 49 for Cure to 62 for Solar. Yeah, I think he doesn't even want to have any SCVs mining into that base because that's the only weak point, the only point he can counterattack. It's just leave the SCVs in your main and just try to keep pressing with his push. Oh, no! Oh, the SCVs come back out at the worst possible time. More adepts coming in. That Liberator almost getting taken out by the Queen. Well, dude, I think Solar's done it. Yeah, what an insane hold. And the fact that he didn't send uh, SCVs over there, he wasn't mining, oh. um, or sent them late, that's it, GG. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so do you think we were right or wrong about that when he didn't have the SCVs at the third base rock? Because I think there's something to it where it's like counter attacks don't work. I'm almost certain that it was intentional because yeah. Cure was maxed with a really big army supply and he wanted to go for the killing blow. There was no fourth command center underway. And the counterattacks for Solar were just nonstop there at the third base. So I think the logic there for Cure is, you know what? I'm just going to oversaturate my main and my natural. Yeah. I'm almost max. It's about my standing army right now. It's not so much about it's, it was all about the reinforcements. Cu cutting off oxygen for the Zerg and just basically making it so there is no weak point. He was never going to try to bank units. He was going to full rally yeah. the whole time. But I got to say, man, those Ultras, they saved the day because the army was pretty much pure Marine there for Cure. The only real anti ground that he had that could deal with the Ultras was the Liberators. And Solar just kind of skirted around them in the best possible way. Those Marines got almost no damage done to the Ultras. They're probably doing one or two damage at most. Yeah. And Solar with basically no economy was able to Face off against that Terran Force, just an insane hold. And Cure is one game away from being eliminated here in GSL. Hey man, could happen. Let's see if it's gonna be the case here in game two. Side Solar. Okay, so um, really impressive stuff from Solar. I can't he, believe he, was he held that. So close to being killed off. The Ultras did change the math entirely. If he didn't go for those Ultras, if they didn't pop at that time, or if the if the armor upgrade for the Ultralisk was just a little bit delayed. That could have been a different game. I mean, imagine if those Ultras aren't entering that fight and aren't on the map for another 30 seconds, right? Then suddenly, those Marines, they're able to trade efficiently with a Liberator setup against everything that Solar had. So, Solar it, it really was, with a miracle hold. It was easy to miss, too, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Like, there was so much action happening. Also, there was a period where I think about a third of the big infantry army just hit, connected with the Banes. Yeah. And that really uh, takes the wind out of your sails. I think there were maybe two moments in that game where yeah. Solar got some really big bailing hits. And well, also when Kier was um, kiting down at the 6 o'clock base, it didn't take the long way around. He tried to go right back up to the middle. Then he got sandwiched. And Solar was doing all of that on a very low drone count, which yeah. absolutely was the correct call because Kier was not playing for a late game. It was... Almost reminiscent of the CC first all-in meta that we saw in TBZ, maybe oh, I think yeah. it was last year, where Terran would just you know go for that command center first, kind of get some advantage, and then try to just end the game off of that. The push was really reminiscent of that, even though we got there in an entirely different way with a two-racks Reaper opening. 
where there wasn't a follow-up for Cure. He was investing everything into that attack, and it almost broke Solar. If Solar just mismicroed a little bit more, or if his macro wasn't on point, or if he shed a couple more drones, then suddenly that's Cure going up 1-0 in the series. That's about as close to a razor's edge of a TVZ as you can get in those low economy situations. So he did get one drone kill, which is pretty big. We don't have a drone hidden on the map to take one of the two um, realistically uh, seizable locations here for the third hatchery. And I don't think we're going to get one for a little bit. We're going to have to wait for Zergling speed. And this is one of the reasons why this build is so strong. You can deny the hatchery by forcing a cancel and then killing the drone, or you could deny it by basically killing it in its crib and never letting it start. And that's exactly what we have now. Yeah, and that's really smart here for Cure. As a result, his third command center is going to be so much, so much faster than the third hatchery of Zerg. Even if he gets his drone, which I think he oh might. Oh, wow! That was sick. He's you gonna know, send a, no, no, this is actually a little bit of a mind game. He sends the uh, next drone to the same location because he knows it's likely the Reaper's mm, going to bank around to the other one. That's smart. I mean, that drone almost was saved by the extractor. Yeah. Fighting that is the best move when you kill it right before it gets on there. Yeah. In fighting games, they would call that some like per frame perfect, right? That's it was right. just <laughs> a game tick away almost of becoming an extractor and actually getting that third base up. But so it's uh, third command center, but um, factory here. We did have the two cyclones, and I think it was two hellions made, or two hellions then two cyclones made I in the last game. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what the order was, but I, I believe you are correct. And I think this is the same opening here for Cure. He did this on site Delta against DRG. He did it against Solar, and once again, he is doing it here against Solar again in game number two. He's going for Stim. He's building some Marines. He's getting two Cyclones out off of a four Reaper opening with a faster command center every single time. And I got to say, I, I feel like the defense for DRG was better, but the transition out of the defense did not work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Solar, even though it, it felt like he was kind of getting slowed down in terms of creep spread, in terms of macroing up with his fourth base, against the Cyclones and the Reapers and the Stim Marines. On his low drone count, which I think he cut around, I'm trying to remember, I think it was somewhere, somewhere around like 66, 65. He was barely able to fund the economy to just stave off the aggression of Cure. And I wonder if Cure is going to recognize that from the previous game and play this one a little bit differently because I could easily see him working in a fourth command center with this build instead of going for an almost all-in tactic the same way that we saw in game number one because I'm worried for Cure if he goes through the same all-in tactic because Solar's defense has been so on point in the mid-game in ZVT. I mean, do you really want to hedge your bets on going for the same strategy that failed in game number one or do you want to transition into something else is what I'm wondering here for Cure. I mean, a lot of this mirrors game one, but I think game one was lost due to bad movement and not bad ideas. I think this opening up to this point this is, is fine. I think it's totally fine. Yeah, this this might even be something that we see as more of a standard opening here. Let's see all those grenades go down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rapid firing them on the on the tumors. So, I think as we watch this roaming process for the Terran, we want to see if there's going to be a misstep because oh. you know this army is scary. Right. But it, it doesn't have medevacs above it, so it, it can't get away if it's surrounded. That's kind of the uh, the the the, uh, the pro and, and, and con at the same time. You have a lot of muscle there, but if you think, I guess there's what two medevacs now. But you get the idea. You can't pick it all up, and to lose too much of anything is going to be a problem. A great counterattack. I mean, a lot of the same ideas happening in game two that happened in game one. This basically mirrors game number one thus far. Even three more barracks going down. So I think Cure is going to play the same three base powering style and not really go for a fourth command center. It did not work for him previously. And this is, again, I'm getting deja vu. Of course, the siege tank here. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> sick. Changes the dy dynamic a little bit. Not actually worth losing those links for just a handful of SCVs, but. Cure once again, but going to be playing this very aggressive style. Now, I like the point that you made about how all these units cannot get lifted up into the medevacs. And so there is a bit of a risk here for Terran, but I think the important thing is that the Marines can get lifted. The Marines can survive. Units like Hellions, like Cyclones, like the Reapers, they don't scale very well into the mid and the late game, but Marines are always going to be the backbone of your army. So 
There's a, clearly a lot of thought that goes into this early game setup here for Cure, but here in Alcyone, it's a little bit harder for him to work his way around and harass that fourth base just because of the nature of the map. Yeah, I mean, there's an opening there now, but it doesn't allow for a very easy path for your uh, reinforcements to come by the ground, but he's basically waiting for the medevacs to spawn, scooping that army up. And he might end up with a pretty good position, although not easily uh, reinforced. Uh, over here, just outside the gold base. Yeah, right over here. And they're actually going to be siege tanks, I believe, joining the fray. And oh, this is kind of a cute position here down by the fourth base. Now, it's very, very removed from the rest of the map. So, I mean, there is a, an amount of time that Solar can buy to try to finish this off. We have the attack coming down here. Now, there's no siege tank on the high ground. There is one in the back, but I think both sides are going to suffer some losses here. Yeah, absolutely. There was a bunker that bought a lot of time. These SCVs are going to try and retreat back into the natural expansion. Meanwhile, Solar going for the surround oh for a moment there. Oh, my God. He needs to get that hatchery now. That's very oh. low. Well, oh, that oh. might just be enough links. Yeah, Curious to pick up, but there's going to be a full surround on the Siege Sinks, on the Cyclones, on the Reapers. It's the same story from game one. Yeah. It's like what Curious trying to set up with his pushes, clearly, at least if Solar's behind the wheel, He's able to just get enough to shut it down. And once again, there's no fourth command center follow-up, at least none that I see so far on the production tab here for Kieran. And although he has been relatively cost efficient, it's hard to say because it, it, this does kind of ring true to the same story in game number one. Yeah. As Solar now has Hive Tech, he has Adrenal Glands coming in. I think eventually against this Marine base style, we're going to see Ultralisks enter the fray, too, oh once Solar gets his economy online. Now, five drones do go down. These are some nice picks for Cure, but the standing army for Solar is so strong. 68 links, 14 banelings, and very healthy upgrades. Viper is also entering the fray. And even more barracks coming down for Cure. So Cure is just basically going all in off these three command centers, exactly the same way as game number one, and exactly the same way as game number one. We have one Viper and an Ultralisk den coming through I'm, and I'm glad we're getting to cash this game again. Yeah. This one's going to be even better than game one. It's the now, remix. <laughs> in game one, uh, there were no SCVs mining at the third base. We uh, posited that that might have been so that counterattacks couldn't curb the progress of the rush. This game, there are yeah. not only SCVs mining, there's a tank and a bunker and a depot wall there. So there might actually be enough momentum behind the Terran that um, he's able to make this work. Yeah, so it seems like he's just going to try and put pressure on both these fourth bases with Siege Tanks on the low grounds. And this one just going to get forfeited here by Solar. I, again, I'm, I'm getting deja vu to game number one with Solar sacrificing bases like this to wait for upgrades like Carapace, like melee attacks, like Adrenal, and eventually like Ultras yep. to enter the map. Cure is playing a little bit more passively. He hasn't really had, I, sh I could say, as many missteps in this game. The counterattacks for Solar have not been as strong. And this bunker, it's not full. Solar's just going to try and plow through this position, but I think the reinforcements are enough that not too much is going to fall here for Cure. Just two SCVs, in fact. So the economy for Cure is still very healthy. Upgrades right now. 1-1 one, one for Cure. 2-2 two, two for Solar. 2-2 two, two still a little bit of a ways off here for Cure. Uh, so we've got actually a lot of light, a nice um, Widow Mine hits. That was pretty good. The drops are, are fanning out into different pots, spots on the map. He's getting driven away in each of these, though. It's, again, four base to three base. The ultras are coming out. Now, oh, my god, those are crazy. But what are my connections oh, wow. here? The drops for Cure are so good, though. He's getting down these extractors. He's killing drones. He's taking cost-efficient trades against the lings. It just doesn't seem like the positioning's very good here. He's going to get the hatchery. Yeah, the hatchery goes down. He's going to lift up. And, OK, these banelings, he will be able to lift off away from that. Actually getting the queens, too. I feel like Cure Dude. is playing a much better game this time in terms of the multi-prong harass. He's just everywhere. These drops are getting so much done. All these trades are cost efficient. Well, he's just never engaging with the Ultras. He just is instead just hitting everywhere else. Well, there isn't the same full frontal assault that we had in the previous game. This right. time, Cure has the economy to just focus on multi-prong attacks, and he's actually finally going into a fourth base. And I think Cure, this is the game plan that he wanted to go for in yeah. game number one, but couldn't because of the counterattacks. And you can see why he's going back to it here in game two, because this is looking so scary. 130 army supply to 54. 
as I think we're going to a nice. game three. And we can really see the reason why Kira is going back into this style is because if the defense at home is solid, Kira is so confident in his multi park attack that he can make this low eco Terran style work. And while Solar looks so dominant in his defense in game number one, Kira's attacks were so good in game number two. And so now I'm wondering what's going to happen in game three. Are we going to go to the same opening style for Kira that he's dished out three times? We could. In TVZ, or we, is we, we going to go back to something absolutely crazy? Well, nobody says that either of these guys have to play the same game. But if I was Kira, I would be definitely confident in the adjustments I made, protecting yeah. that third uh, base, closing with Marauders, disengaging from Ultras, and instead dropping you know, anywhere uh, that they're not. Ultras are not fast units. They're basically like the slowest units Zerg have as far as like things that chase down Marines. So if you could just pick a spot where they're not, it's gonna work out. Now, Solar, he can do whatever he wants too. He could do some crazy cheese. He doesn't have to go for a macro game. The sky's the limit. And we're gonna be on this map too, Solaris. Yeah, it's his That's where map. he was born. <laughs> All right, going into map number three, the winner of this match will advance to the round of four. The loser is out of code S. Side Solar Okay Game three it is the final game of this side of the round of eight as we close out group a and um, I Should point out immediately it is barracks on high ground, so it's probably not going to be the double racks Reaper Although I guess in theory you could just make the two racks in your main and do the same thing, but I, I doubt it's that. So uh, this is going to be a different set of ideas here for Cure. And look, I think that Solar did a good job defending in some ways where it's like, well, I can win there, but maybe I should try one of the other tools at my disposal. And Cure has, again, shown a really big range in all the matchups. He's, he's in better condition than he's ever been before. And that's saying a lot because he was always up at the top. Years past, there was moments where he was pretty inconsistent. He'd have a couple seasons where he just flounder, or it just didn't seem like he's up to date with the meta. And I'm not holding that against him. I mean, what we're in like the 13th or 12th year here of GSL, and uh, you know some seasons players are more focused than others. But what I'm trying to get at is that this season, he looks really good. Cures look good all year. Yeah. He's only really been stopped by Maru in GSL. I think. In yeah. fact, if I if I try to remember the playoffs from season one and season two, I actually believe that Cure might have only been eliminated by Maru in GSL Code S this year. And now that Maru is out of the picture, Cure looking to solidify himself as the best player in Korea. And he's done such a good job of becoming a more well-rounded player over time. I love the confidence for him to go back to the exact same style in game number two knowing that it didn't work in game number one, but knowing that he has the ability to make adjustments, to change his game plan, to adapt to the way that Solar defended it, and make it work. And now to come here in game number three, with a really fast third command center, one barracks opening. This is significantly greedier than the openings that we saw from him in game one and game two. And so I wonder if this is gonna be Cure gunning for something more akin to a macro game because both in game one and game two against Solar and in one of the games against DRG, Cure played what was almost a three base all in style. In game number two, he eventually did get the fourth command center up, but by then the outcome of the game was effectively determined. Right. Whereas with a slightly greedier setup with a Hellion opening, Tech Lab coming down, might even be Hellion Banshee, one of the classic compositions that Terran used to op up, open up with in previous patches. This is the kind of setup that can easily come in and get some damage done later in the game. But actually, Solar coming through doesn't get the surround of the Hellion. That would have been a very nice catch. Yeah, instead, he's going to get right back out. I can't wait to see what the game plan is from either of these players. Well, it, again, very different here from Cure Banshee coming out as more Hellions are made. 
there is that third CC that we, we talked about earlier, but um, you know, he doesn't have to land that right away. And then, you know, from the Zerg, I think he needs to do a little bit more droning before we're going to see any kind of definitive tech. This is usually the quieter part of the matchup. Uh, and the Hellions are going to come across the map, but look, if they can kill drones, great. Cre creep tumor is probably more likely. Yeah, it's more about just taking map control here for Cure. Any, anything like this, any play that you make where you deny mining time and put pressure on the Zerg, it's always efficient. It doesn't cost you anything there. You already have the Hellions on the map. You might as well use them. As we have Banshee production continuing here. Hellions, oh, that's kind of a funky spike. I don't think you want to be there. Okay. Wow, I, I am very surprised they did not die. <laughs> I think Cure maybe might have microed them on the mini-map and had a bit of a misread on where they would be going. Those Hellions surely will go back home to get repaired. Yeah, now I didn't see an armory made here, so we're not gonna have any kind of Hellbad push. No, instead more barracks coming in. Stam now being researched here as Cure just continuing to power up. And I wonder when he is going to land that command center on the low ground because Solar, even going back quite some time, he has the capability of bringing aggression when you don't expect it, and he can be very good in those kind of aggressive plays too. So right. here, he has to respect that potential here from Solar. It does seem like Solar is playing more of a defensive macro focus style instead of going for that kind of aggression, getting Spore Crawlers in all these bases, adding on double evolution chambers, building up a very healthy drone count. And Kira finally gonna land that command center there on the low ground, so. Both players really just kind of gearing up for the mid game. 1-1 one, one starting at nearly the same time. Both for Terran and Zerg as these Banshees move in on the third base. Now you need to kill off a certain number of drones here to really get the value out of it. They get three, nicely done. Uh, the Zerg is going with the fourth base pretty quickly, which there's not a lot the Banshees can do to deny. So he gets up to six, not bad. Uh, he may send those back to just get repaired up. I think almost certainly he will. Yeah. So the Banelings Nest is coming along as well as the 1-1. One, one. Oh, actually, what? Oh, the Banshees got sniped. At least one of Where? them did on the minimap. Oh, man. I want to see the. I saw the units yeah. tab for a moment. But, one of them got killed. Yeah, he tried to you know, basically beeline it instead of making an L move down to the bottom right corner and then go all the way back. Yeah, Solar had some really smart queen placement. And, you know, the Hellions are coming up, but there's no drones that they can attack into. Um, this is expansion's not done. These Hellions. Oh, I love, I love them going yeah. for the angle to splash down both the active that, tumors. That was very cool. Oh, even getting one of these. Uh, it doesn't look like he kills the second one. If yeah, any, any damage you can do to kind of slow down the creep spread because this is going to be essential for setting up the push that's going to come later in the game as Cure is now adding in his second factory. He is getting an armory. And we're basically ready to go. So, I mean, we're going to have push one come out. So this is a very focused three base push, there's an armory that's gonna come as well. So maybe you morph these into Hellbats and kind of space them out in between the Marines and the tanks. Yeah, also unlock plus two infantry weapons and Absolutely. infantry armor. And I really wouldn't mind for Cure to also work in plus one vehicle weapons with a push like this. If he's gonna play two factory and really lean heavily into Widow Mines into siege tanks with this push, could be a good game plan as he's going to start posturing outside of the fourth base. Now the Marines and the Hellions are going to move forward and take care of the most advanced tumors. 1-1 one, one is done on both sides, but Solar is actually setting up for a massive flank. Bailing yeah. speed is about three quarters of the way done. Keep in mind it does research faster now in this patch than it used to previously. There's just enough medevacs to pick up, I think, the Marines exclusively. Yeah, I think you're right about so that. So maybe, maybe there's one or two extra Marines here, but this pincer attack is going to be huge. In fact, three different angles to do damage. This oh. looks pretty scary here for Cure. Wow, what a surround coming in from Solar. He is just going to clean up all the factory units there. Cure is going to try and take what he can get by going into the main base, but a Spore Crawler is already waiting for him. Even repositioning here to try and make it harder to retreat. Queen continuing to focus down that medevac. It might fall. Dude, uh, it's getting that's so sick. Look at the defense here by Solar. That was yeah. just impeccable. I mean, the, the two spores there to just try to drive that to the south was really good, but the fact that he didn't uh, bum rushed it with the spore, which you don't see anywhere near as often. Yeah, Solar is playing this so well. We do have Drilling Claws coming in for Widow Mines with these two factory setup. Oh, oh man, those Marines. They're very slow to get into the medevac, but luckily the Banelings did not connect with them as a fourth command center now in production. And this is kind of the more classic cure style that we see in the past where he is happily trying to macro up on four bases while levying pressure on the Zerg is 
This might scale up to be the most epic TBZ of the night. Hive Tech is coming in, Macro Hatchery going on in, here in the main base. Solar also expanding down. So the bottom right position is Cure. Looks to set up another two-prong attack. This Banshee's still alive. Trying to do what it can to shut down the Hive Esping Geyser expansion as both players multitasking will start to get really tested in the next couple of moments. Yeah, I mean, so far, Cure still is a threat on the map. Beautifully done with the Widow Mines. Mm -hmm. Just taking the value out of those Banelings. And it's no longer Cure with a big push. Instead, it's these small harass squads. The one down here, and anytime you get too surrounded, you pick up and get back out. Same is true for the army that's floating over at 12 o'clock. But we don't have a position uh, where Cure could try to uh, grab onto a part of the map and use that as a launching pad for attacks where he can cover it with Siege Tanks. But as 2-2 finishes up here uh, as upgrades for Cure, maybe that will change. Yeah, and I'm patiently watching the production tab, waiting for Cure to start making transition into Ghosts, into more tanks as these Marines will lift up in the Medivax. Skirting disaster from those Banelings, and it's worth noting that this is not going to be the same Ultralisk style from Solar as we saw before. Cure almost getting that third queen as well. What a my next shot is also very big. Great control on both sides of this game so far, I have to say. And, I mean, this is becoming a lot crazier and a lot more dramatic than the last two games combined. Absolutely. Solar continues to grow. Oh my god, good denial there. Good cancel, too, from Solar. Um, but Cure is getting a ridiculous amount of the map. Seismic Spines is being researched, so... Now, the way this map is usually cut up is straight down the middle. So Terran gets the left side, Zerg gets the right. Mm. Although it's an interesting one, later on in the game, there are rocks in the middle of the map that can be destroyed to open up more pathways. And of course, we do have these speed zones. <laughs> Man, Ling Ling's move so fast in those speed zones. Yeah, it's kind of hilarious. As Kira's going to try and station himself over here, Solar once again going to try and get a surround, but just a little bit too hard to push off creep. This is why any kind of push that Cure can do to slow the creep spread in any section of the map is essential for imposturing for later attacks like this one where he can trade cost efficiently with the Zerg. Three more barracks going down to the main base of Cure. He's going to lift up. Vipers are now out, so Cure does have to respect that. As he's just continuing this two-prong harassment, I'm looking at the mini-map, but he's once again setting up to go for yet another attack near the 12 o'clock position as his bio is maneuvering over down into the bottom right side. Actually, he's going to go for the main base. I think he wants to get the Hive. Yeah, well, this is not a bad idea. I mean, there's definitely a lot of uh, tension down here at the bottom. We do see units already wrapping around up into the uh, the main here. Meanwhile, this push continues on downward. Uh, Marauders in the front to tank versus those oh. Banelings. And look at this. This is a very tough position to break. Yeah, it's a very good spread there for Cure. It will get wow. cleaned up. But about as good a trade as you're going to get there on the Terran side of things. And also this, man, we completely missed this. Well, even I mean, hitting the triangle, there are Cures everywhere on yeah, the map I mean, right he's, now. He's just, uh, Cure is hitting so many locations at once. He's down in supply, but it's worth it to take out these extra bases. And Cure's continuing to grow on the map. Yeah, I, it's worth noting that Cure right now is throwing down additional command centers. He has planetary fortresses morphing in the top left and also the center left positions of the map. Ghost production has begun. I would not be surprised to see Cure start pumping out some siege tanks to really the anchor the defense on his side as I feel like we're getting ready to go into a later and later game in TBZ. I don't think either of these players are really at a breaking point where they can be defeated. I think Solar, if he's able to get some big hits, might be able to mount a counterattack and get some damage done as the siege tank after Cure right now, it's sitting only at one. And Solar, it seems like he does want to get aggressive. There is no planetary base here at the Triangle Third, so I would not be surprised if Cure almost forfeited this position, but there are so many supply depots that... You, you got to wonder if he could lift off and just try to save this for later. Yeah. Uh, but with the number of Hydras coming in here, the damage is going to really pile on. The Banelings are being pulled up. Beautiful blinding clouds here as those Banelings go right through to deal additional damage. More blinding clouds going to be in the cards here as they get the ghost on the top side of the map. Actually, SCV is getting pulled. The battle with the SCV, with the, with the uh, Zerglings, excuse me. As Kira scans the bottom right of the base, he wants to try and go in with a Doom Drop yet again here and get another Hatchery Sniper. That was a great aggressive move by Solar. Really, when you're playing ZBT late games like this one, you want to deny Terran from getting their ninth and their 10th Vespian Geysers because as Terran eventually works into their late game economy, 
They want to have a healthy number of Ghosts. They want to have a good number of Stargate units like these Medivacs. They want to be able to get a healthy number of Siege Tanks to be able to get basically the perfect Ghost, mess composi Go ghost Mech composition to play defensively. But thus far, it hasn't really been able to happen here for Cure. He's making these trades happen in the middle of the map, but, map, but his army composition it's not quite as powerful as he would like to have at this stage in the game. Uh, we have a great attack up here. Bane's uh, actually really not getting value, weirdly enough. He does end up killing the Planetary. I think he wanted to save some of those Banes, either get SCVs or uh, other workers. So I got to say, you know, it, it was pretty neck and neck, but I think Solar, the way he's pushed out and shut down these two locations, it's actually three base Terran here. And keep in mind that the third base that's left over is probably low on minerals. So. Suddenly, we're going to have these two very exposed areas on the map um, for the Terran where, you know, you need to get a third, of the, uh, sorry, a fourth and a fifth base back up. Right now, it seems like Solar's taking his lumps and is back in action. Solar's just playing this game so incredibly well. The aggression on both the triangle third and that expansion in the top left side of the map has completely stymied the economy here for Cure. And Cure is going to move out on the map. Oh, this is a dangerous position. That's a lot of very expensive units. Actually, Ling's coming in from the top side, looking for the surround. Will the Banelings connect with the Ghost? Oh. There are Parasitic Bombs on the Medivacs. That's very low HP. Almost every single Medivac is going to go down to the Parasitic Bombs. So Cure, although he was able to retain a lot of the Ghost and Bio on the ground, his Medivac count getting almost completely reset, and his economy, it's struggling to keep up with this. Now, look at the Minerals and Gas here for Solar. He's loaded. He just needs to get enough Banelings to smash both positions, and it's probably going to go back into his favor for Tempo. Oh, there aren't enough Medivacs to lift up the Bio anymore, so Solar can completely go for this around. A couple key units are getting lifted, and a counterattack oh. here in the Triangle Third. I think Solar yeah. is starting to break Cure. His economy is completely non-existent, and the other base gets lifted up. In a classic TVZ game, he just defends, defends, defends until it's finally his turn. And his turn, excuse me, and it's he's too big to fail. I mean, Solar just playing a masterful ZBT right now, consuming the map. Over half the map is covered in creep as Solar even expanding all the way into the 12 o'clock position. The Banelings continuing to come in. Cure down at 113 supply. Yeah, this is going to be it. I think Cure has to tap out. GG, Solar survives. And he is going to be our secondary player to get out of Group A. Moving on to the round of four in the final season of this year's GSL Code S. Wow, what a tremendous series. Solar really showing some fantastic CVT skills. And I, the GSL, the season of upsets, it continues. Cure absolutely was the favorite coming into this group, but instead it's going to be Cure, or Cure, excuse me, Gumiho, and Solar advancing to the round of four. Pretty incredible stuff. I never thought Kier was going to not make it. Yeah. I thought, especially as the way the day started, where it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's good. But here we are. Solar, through pure tenacity, survives. And he is moving on. Solar, let's talk to you. Congratulations. Thank you. An amazing match. You were oftentimes eliminated in the quarterfinals. Every single GSL, but this season's different. This season, you defeated all these amazing tournament favorites, Maru and Cure. You must feel very different now. Tell us about that. If I come to the studios, Wow. I thought it was 50% that I could make it. Otherwise, I might just get flushed out. Since I got defeated pretty uh, helplessly, I was really discouraged. But in the end, I managed to pull it together and win. It seemed like you really were good at macro. Uh, it had some great counterattacks. Uh, can you tell us about that? As the games are developing, I thought, let's just do what I think I'm confident in. Let's let the games develop normally. I think if, if I could polish up this play style, I could continue to execute. 
그 힘든 순간에 뭔가 한 경기 지고 난 이후에 오늘 좀안 풀리겠다는 생각 들었을 때 그때 어떤 You've 생각을 하시고 이걸 버텨낸 거예요? You've had a very tough series. All the uh, games you played went to full sets. 사실 회자전 갔을 때는 괜찮았던 게 제가 회자전 1세트에 좀 허무하게 내어줘 When I went to the elimination matchup even though I lost earlier on in a pretty brutal fashion, I always have confidence in CVC, so I knew I had that going for me. When I lost against Cure, I thought, oh, maybe there's something wrong with my play today. I probably can't make it, but after that, it was okay. Do you think he can make it to the finals? Well, so far, I've defeated all these really strong opponents. Maro Kira Hero. Now I'm really riding on high confidence. So I think this could be my season. Oh, they're talking about his pajama pants. They're teasing him about his pants. They're saying the pajama pants work. If he made it out second, if Dark makes it, do you think you have a chance to face off against Dark and are you confident versus Dark? No, I think there's no opponent I, I uh, should fear. Anybody's doable. Well, you made it to the semifinals after years and years. I'm sure you have different goals. Tell us about your goals. For all the fans who've been supporting me for the past decade, I hope I can show a great performance. And, and I really want to show that I'm a world-class Zerg, so please watch for that. He says, congratulations again. Solar says, thank you. Wow. And, uh, wow, 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 wow. What a day. What a day, dude. Pretty much every this was series crazy. went to game three. Honestly, had... the TVT was the best, though. Yeah, we that had, was we so had good. We some, some really great TVZs, but the TVT was crazy. Yeah. I'm excited to see Gumiho. I actually, I kind of hope Bunny advances now. Yeah. <laughs> out, of, uh, out of the group on Thursday, just so we can see more of Gumiho's TVTs. That was... One of the best treats I've ever had to watch yeah. or to cast. An incredible game here as we look at how things are developing in the round of eight. Gumiho and Solar advancing over Cure and DRG into the semifinals. Gumiho in first place will face whoever gets second in Group B. Solar in second place will face the winner of Group B. And That's it's right. going to be a fun group. We got Creator, Classic, Dark, and Bunny. A little bit of everything in that one. And I got to say, I, I feel like... Dark is going to advance no matter what. His condition so. is incredible, especially it feels like against Protoss, the only Protoss in the world, I think, that could be Dark right now. It seems like it's Hero, and he's already out of the tournament. So, But I want to point out as well, Creator could get to the finals it's possible. of this. I think a lot of the people that normally knock him out are gone. Yeah. So <clears throat> maybe Creator actually wins this finals of the, the GSL. It's possible. His best matchup is PvZ, and there is a world where you know, Creator versus Classic should be the first match of that series to PvP. If Creator right. wins, then if Dark beats Bunny, Creator doesn't need to beat any Terrans to make it into the round of four. That's true. So That's true. There's, it's a very different uh, set of remaining players. Obviously, some usual phases, but the fact that we don't have the powerhouses like Maru right now yeah. um, in this really, you know, makes this a toss-up. There's a lot of different universes that could be created. Uh, for the round of four, depending on how Group B goes. Even having Cure eliminated today, I feel like, is such an upset for this series. It's, Cure it's is, in my opinion, either the best or yeah. the second best Terran in Korea on any day of the week. So, yeah, things are developing at a pretty interesting pace here at GSL. We're getting a lot of upsets. The new patch, the new map, seem to have shaken the meta up quite a bit. And, and it's been a treat to cast. The games have been so good. We've had, yeah, such great games. I know that there was a lot of, uh, I guess, outrage or, or fear about the patch. But so far, the games have been really good. Um, we have a lot of the pros saying we need some more time to, to kind of let um, the game unpack itself, let the game bloom or blossom, however you want to phrase it. Um, to really see where exactly it's at. But what a journey this season has been um, to watch that development occur and to see where we finally end up at.
Yeah, we've had some really fun different builds, different approaches to the game as Again, GSL on-site viewing guide. Make sure you buy those tickets online at the link below. Get the tickets the moment that you can get them. They open on the 27th, so Friday, 5 p.m. That's Korea time. Google that, uh, whatever your time is in, in KST uh, for 5 p.m. here. You can get the tickets online. I think the tickets for the finals will sell out. I'd be surprised if they didn't. Some days in the studio are bigger than others, but our finals, I think, have basically always sold out. Yeah, so get so, those as yeah. soon as you possibly can. You don't not want to try to come in as the last minute getting in the door. Yeah, and then otherwise, you're going to be at a out. restaurant or a bar down the street, a cafe, on your phone watching, which, I mean, that could be fun too, but uh, just do what we're saying. They sell out usually in minutes. Yeah. Any any a freaking TV final sells out literally in minutes, so you got to get your ticket buying APM up. Ticket buying at p.m. Yeah, you got to snipe them. Grind some ladder games just that's to get right. warmed up right before, right. Right before the clock you hits the timer. You need to buy timer. tickets for other stuff that's not as popular <laughs> to get warmed up. Uh, you got to make like sure that, you have the yeah. right mouse. You can move it over the purchase button in time. Wow. Well, purchase it with your own gear. It's a good meta. Yeah. Uh, that's all the time we have, guys. We'll be back on Thursday at 6.30 p.m. for Group B of the Round of Eight. We love you. Bye-bye.